Welcome everyone to the December 18th Selectman's meeting. Uh, at this time, I'd like to ask uh, Selectman Imos to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, please. We're back where we're supposed to be. <laughs> Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. I'll accept the motion to accept the minutes. So moved. Second. So forth. Are there any modifications or edits to the minutes? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Opposed? Thank you very much. This time, welcome everybody. Some of you are new faces, some very new faces. Hi. Um, so at this part of the meeting, we uh, open it up to new public business. That is, if something is not on our agenda for this evening and you'd like it to bring it to the attention of the selectmen, we're welcome to hearing your, uh, uh, your thoughts. So is there any new public business tonight? Oh, seeing none. We'll move on. Uh, I'm going to ask the uh, indulgence of the board to move item number five up next. Uh, as is the uh, uh, desire of the board when we have uh, citizens before us and people before us, we like to uh, get those up early um, as opposed to some of the more uh, administrative tasks that we sometimes have to uh, uh, follow. So at this time, the board will consider confirmation of an appointment to the Conservation Commission. Mr. Town Manager. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, with us tonight is Vanessa Curran. Um, she's wearing the blue jacket. She's accompanied by her mother. And Vanessa, no, just kidding. Um, Vanessa Curran uh, is a, is a uh, candidate for the Conservation Commission. We have an opening on the commission. Uh, Vanessa actually reached out uh, to the town. I believe she's, you said you were online paying your electric bill and you came across a posting for uh, an opening. Um, you received a copy of her talent pool application tonight. Uh, she's probably overqualified, uh, but we're thrilled to, uh, that she's interested in, in volunteering for the town. Um, Aaron Schaefer, our principal planner, uh, had a chance to sit with Vanessa and speak with her about the opening. I also had the chance to talk to Vanessa. Um, I think she would be an excellent fit. And um, so she's here tonight to introduce herself and answer any questions that you may have. Wonderful. I'll start with the board. Uh, Mr. Mills. No questions. I just want to say the qualifications and the, the process that Steve has uh, undertaken as far as soliciting citizens to, you know, take part in their government is wonderful. And this is another example how it superbly works. What a qualified person this is for the, con I, through the years I did lots of work with the Conservation Commission and it's very important stuff. And I'm so glad that uh, you're willing to do that. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I agree with the uh, Selectman Mills. Um, we're really thankful that you brought somebody into our meeting to start it off so pleasant. And uh, I know how hard it is with children to volunteer for these jobs. So thank you so much for stepping forward. Thank you. I appreciate you coming in so that we get to meet you in a way. Uh, certainly we appreciate Steve's support and recommendation. But as a selectman, we make uh, appointments and approvals. So it's helpful to know who we're approving to these positions. Sure. So thank you very much for coming in. And yes, your qualifications uh, state themselves. Second clock. Thank you. I'm most impressed with your qualifications. It's amazing. And you're a good example of what there is out there in the community. Hopefully you can find peers that are available and want to will are willing to work in the communities as well in town. But thank you very much for kind of volunteer your services. And it's great to see a new generation <coughs> of people who are int intelligent to wants to really get into this and so well versed. Thank you very much for volunteering. And I too was blown away by your resume. It's amazing how much environmental analysts and, and, and environmental experience you have, both education and work experience. Uh, I have no other questions. Um, so at this time, I'll, I'll accept the recommendation from the board. I move that we accept the applicant as presented. Second. Uh, motion made and seconded. Any question on the motion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you for your service. We Thank appreciate you. your volunteerism. Thank you. Yay, Mommy! You can say yay, Mommy now. <laughs> you did good. <laughs> you did a great job. That's great. All right. We'll move back to our uh, regular agenda schedule at this point. <clears throat> the board in receipt of an application by Friends of Hawthorne, John Corvin, Road Race Event Coordinator, for a first time banner over Maple Street, April 29th to May 5th. 2019. Is there someone to speak to this application? Yes, oh, I'm Mr. There you Gorman. are. How are you? Could you introduce yourself, sir? I am John Gorvin. I am a psychologist at the Hogan Regional Center. 
in Danvers, and I am the race director for the event we held one year ago, um, on well, May 19th a year ago, and we have already been approved with your indulgence for holding the race again May 20th this year. And so th this is your opportunity to kind of give a little bit about what the race is, who benefits, what the route is, a little pu free publicity as it were. So the um, Friends of Hawthorne is the nonprofit arm of the Hogan Regional Center in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And all the proceeds of the event from a year ago went to that group and that money was used to enhance the client recreational budgets for folks that not only live at the Hogan Regional Center but also residents from the Northeast Residential Services programs which are spread all about the North Shore. And in the first year we had 135 runners and walkers. Uh, we were able to make just over $3,000 in the event and we were hoping for a little more, few more runners and a little more money but that gives us something to shoot for this year. And as part of that, we have decided to um, pursue obtaining a banner, and we've begun to get the estimates on that, and we're beginning to we'll do the design work on that, which we plan on finishing in January, subject to having your approval this Thank evening you. for using the week, approximately three weeks before the race, April 29th to May 5th, to put the banner up by the Lions Ambulance. Very good. And, Select an Lions. I have nothing. Thank you for your profession in dealing with our special needs people. That's a, a wonderful thing you do. Thank you. So I'm glad to see that that stays open and you're able to service those folks that need with those needs. Um, so appreciate your working to help raise funds for them. It's very important for those people. Thank you. All right. Thank you. No question. Good luck with your event. All right. Thank you. Just like my mills. Thank you for your service. All right, thank you. And I have no questions either. I'll entertain a motion from the board. I move the uh, application as presented. Second. Motion made and seconded. Any questions on the motion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? <coughs> Good luck on your endeavors. All right, thank you thank very you. much. Much success. <clears throat> Item number four, the board is in receipt of an application by Kayla's Cause, James Caron, Blood Drive, event coordinator for first time banner over High Street on January 14th to 20th. Welcome. Good evening. Could I'm you James, introduce yourself? I'm James Karen, Damas resident, president of Kayla's Cause, uh, Damas based nonprofit. Um, Kayla's Cause does a lot with uh, SUDC, um, the, the Roberts program, Boston Children's, and is more focused to helping uh, any families that go through what we went through with Kayla. Uh, we are doing a, a blood drive to fulfill one of our parts of our mission statement, which is to give time, life, and love, and to give life through the blood drive. Um, and this one's not about raising money. So we have all the logistics finished out complete, and we were hoping to hang a banner on the high street side of downtown January 14th through January 20th and um, for the blood drive that would be held at Pickering Street YMCA. Thank you. Selecting like Bennett. Um, when is the blood drive going to take place? The blood drive will be January 27, 2019. The 27th. Hours? All day? Nine to two. Nine to two. Thank you. All set. Thank you, Selecting like Clark. No questions. Good luck. Selecting like Mills. Good luck. Thank you. Selecting like Mills. Thank you. Thank you. And I also thank you, neighbor Sam, and thank you for, uh, for this. Uh, I'll entertain a motion. I move that we accept the application as presented. Second. Motion made and second. Is there any discussion on the motion? <coughs> All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you very much. Can, Thank can you. I just ask, do you know if there has to be appointments for that? And is this at the Y? It is. There was an online sign up um, to prevent any backing up. Yeah. Um, non appointments will, will backfill in the areas where they can. So the goal. The Red Cross expectation is 35, 30 to 35. Our goal is 100, and I think we're going to surpass that. Okay, so I just saw that there is actually, um, you've already done, she's adorable, I'm sorry. But um, there is a poster. Is this already been put up anywhere? Have you sat it? Is We've it in town hall? we put it up at the DCAT. It it's schools? down at the town hall. We haven't done any schools yet, but I'm still in the process of getting all that out. It's at. Uh, the police station, the fire stations, uh, Lions Ambulance, or Atlantic. So um, we're getting it So out. it's kind of very short notice, but um, DEEP, I don't know if you're familiar with DEEP. 
I'm not. Um, so um, you can contact the town manager. They actually can send flyers home with the schools and where you are affiliated so closely with the town. I'm sure that they would be willing to help, but they can send it home in the kids' backpacks once approved. And um, I think they'd be more than willing. That'd so be great. I'll follow up with yeah, that. Thank just, you. The town manager has. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. Oh, one second. I, Go ahead, David. Really, just to follow up on what Diane, I'm just thinking. You know, a lot of people go in. McDonald's on High Street is a very friendly place. You have your cat man do where some of the celebrities uh, go and pay more for their coffee. But there's other places like that, Brothers, you know, around town that a lot of good Danvers people are in and out of all the time. And I bet if they're asked, they'd be thrilled to put up a poster and, that's, and encourage. That's who we're hoping to reach. So I will, I will, uh, I will continue getting these flyers up in downtown and. And I'll reach out to the schools in deep. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Good you luck. Item number six, the board will consider an appointment to the Historic District Commission. Mr. Town Manager. Hey, Mr. Chair. Uh, this is the second of two appointments tonight. Um, there's a, a flyer that you received uh, uh, from Marcus Sidmore, who was uh, on the uh, part of the memorandum at the last meeting. Uh, the board was um, uh, excited to have the opportunity to meet Marcus uh, before uh, placing him on the uh, Historic District Commission. Um, he has met with staff and I believe attended meetings and um, I believe is known to several of the board members tonight. But I, I, he's in attendance tonight and uh, would be, I'm sure, happy to uh, introduce himself or answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much. Selectman Clark, we'll start with you. Okay, thank you very much. I happen to have known not only Marcus but his parents, his grandparents, and his great grandmother. Uh, Marcus is kind of unique in the, as a resident of the historic district. He's one of the few members of a family who's lived there a long time, many generations, who's chosen to stay there. There aren't many people like Marcus up there that have been, can go back two or three generations, and I welcome Marcus, and I know you'll do a great job, and thank you very much for volunteering. I think you ought to give a, people a little bit more background, because I think I was the only one that really knew you pretty well. Will do. Thanks, if you Mr. don't Clark. mind, we'll give us your, uh, introduce yourself and give us a brief CV about yourself. Absolutely. Uh, my name is Marcus Sidmore, as uh, stated. I am the uh, third generation bringing up the fourth generation at 61 Center Street. My grandparents bought it just after World War II ended. Uh, my father was brought up there. Um, I grew up in and around uh, the historic district, playing in the diggings and uh, lighting off firecrackers in the bamboo in between uh, Center Street and Forest Street. You guys didn't hear that. Uh, back in the, the 70s, and uh, I'm happy to remain a, a, a member of the community. I've thought it, uh, in looking at the members of the uh, Historic Commission, I realized that uh, I was pretty sure I was the only one actually living there uh, in the district uh, as, as an active homeowner, um, and I thought it might be time that uh, I get involved uh, with a commission that affects me and mine directly, as well as my neighbors. Um, who I, some of whom I know. Um, I used to run a paper route on that street and lots of the names have changed, but the houses haven't. Um, and uh, that, that was where my interest came from. Great. Thank you. Selectman Mills. I'm very glad that you made this application. Now, Paul Sidmore, who's that? My father. Well, he and I were in Boy Scouts together. Okay. Um, before the first church burned. Okay, yep. that's where we had our meetings. And so I go way back with the Sidmore family. Thank you for your service. Thank you. Is it the same night as Boy Scouts? Is it the same night as Boy Scouts? Why? The fire. Don't answer that. No. Okay. Simon Langley's? I really believe he doesn't remember. Um, thank you for your application and for service. It's, it's a lot of work, but we appreciate it. <clears throat> Happy to serve. Select like Bennett. Marcus, thank you for being willing <coughs> to serve the town, your neighborhood. And thank you for coming before us tonight. That's very important. We appreciate it. I appreciate the invitation. I think at the last welcome, and I uh, thank you for your volunteerism. Is there any more discussion? Is I'll entertain a motion on the uh, application. I move the application as presented. Second. Motion made and second. Is there any more discussion on the application? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you very much. Appreciate your willingness to volunteer. Thank you for the appointment. Good luck, Marcus. All right. At this point, the next uh, item, agenda item, is a public hearing will be had on the application by Elena's Food Corp, doing business as Nick and Andy's Andrew Moley, manager, owner, 110 Newbury Street, for a common appeals license at that location. Is there someone here to speak to that? Yes, sir. 
Would you go to the podium, introduce yourself, and and tell us about your business and the uh, what, what you what you seek from the board today? Yes, uh, my name is uh, Andre Moli. I'm uh, we're looking to open a family restaurant, breakfast and lunch on uh, 110 Newbury Street, prov uh, previously Gigi's. Okay, and uh, what will your hours be? Uh, six to three, sir. Six to three yeah. of seven days a week. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, the application is in order. Uh, I'll start with Selectman Mills. Do you have any questions, sir? No, just, I should know this. 110 Newbury Street, what is that adjacent to? Uh, is, is a shopping plaza, sir, right next to Calitri's? Or who wants Okay, is that the vacant store there? That, yes. Oh, good. Well, I hope that you have a great success there. I'll be in for breakfast. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Selectman Langweiss. No, thank you. Good luck. Thank you. Selectman Bennett. No questions. Thank you, and good luck. Thank you no questions. Good luck. I have no questions as well. Wish you good luck in the town. So at this time, I'll entertain him. Oh, this is a public hearing. Does any member of the public wish to speak to this application? Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Matthew Duggan, town meeting member, precinct one. Just a question of uh, signage at this location. I believe the ZBA granted so, uh, some variances or maybe a special permit. Uh, within the last year for the previous occupant of this location. I was wondering, does that, does that carry over to the new? Uh, that would be the purview of the ZBA, not this board. We're yeah. here to grant a common vehicular's license. Okay, that's, a question that, that's a question that would be best served at the ZBA. So uh, no questions about signage here? No, they, they so we, okay. we identify boards and commissions who maintain. Okay, and, good enough, thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else who'd like to speak to this application in a public hearing? I move that we go ahead. close the public hearing. Second. Motion made to close this public hearing. Any questions on the motion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you. I move that we accept the application as presented. Second. second. Motion made and second on the application. Any questions on the motion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you very much. Good luck to you. Thank you. Good luck. Item number eight, the board is in receipt of an application by Christopher Nolan to Chapel Road, Danvers, her first time appointment as a civil constable in the town of Danvers. I'd ask to start with the town manager. Hey, Mr. Chairman, uh, you received this evening a packet of information from Mr. Nolan. Um, uh, if, if appointed, uh, we would still have several openings uh, le left for constables in town. We currently have seven, so this would make eight. Um, and uh, I believe Mr. Nolan is here to address the board. And uh, I know the, the, the question for the clerk will be, is the paperwork in order? And it is. So. Which includes a, uh, a comment, a review by the police chief and uh, a, uh, uh, his um, recommendation that uh, in favor of this applicant, uh, you received all, the, uh, all of the uh, um, other paperwork that we ask for commonly. Is the applicant here? Sir, would you go to the podium? Could you tell us a little bit about yourself and what your intent uh, as constable will be? Sure, my name is Christopher Nolan. I grew up in Damaris on Two Chapel Road, and I currently reside in the old house that I grew up in. I bought it from my parents about six years ago. Um, grew up through the school system. My children currently go through the school system, and uh, I just want to continue to give back to the community that I was raised in. Okay. Uh, looking at your, uh, your uh, resume, uh, no previous law enforcement, um, I'm sorry, your education is, is law enforcement, uh, training alliance in FEMA. Correct. Uh, what is the intent as a constable, do you believe your duty will be here in town? Uh, civil service. Civil service. Yeah, civil processing. Thank you. And so on. All right. I'll open up to the board. I'll start with Selectman Limas. So I happen to know Chris, and it's really true, all of these notices from his neighbors that they like him. They do. <laughs> they really well, do like you. him. It's, when I saw, nobody gives us notices from their neighbors because most neighbors, you couldn't get that many to say they liked you. So that was really great. I also laughed when you know you decided you needed another job with a five-year-old, a three-year-old. You travel for your job. Your wife's working. I don't know, you know, what's taken you so long to get another job, but um, <laughs> it's really great that you stepped forward. You are a really good person. Thank you very much. And I think you'll do a great job on this, and thank you for uh, doing something that it's a job that I wouldn't do, but good for you. I thank appreciate you. your support very much. Thank you. Thank you. Selectman Bennett. Thank you. Um, 
you're certainly well qualified, well recommended, but my question is why do you want to be a civil counsel? Um, I do like to work. <laughs> um, oh, we all work. Exactly. Um, I do like to work, and I just want to stay within my community and serve the civil uh, process the correct way. I don't believe it's been handled correctly in the past, and I'm looking forward to maybe try to talk to people a little bit differently. And, and I know serving is a tough situation at times, and I just want to be the communicator between the two. So if you have to serve to your neighbors, hopefully they'll still like you after. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'll turn those ones down. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Selectman Clark. I have no questions. Thank you very much for wanting to serve, and I'm glad to see a Danvers resident has applied for a constable job because I think most of them are from out of town that we've had <coughs> in recent years. Good luck, Chris. Thank you, Mr. Clark. Select my mills. Uh, no questions, Christopher. Your application papers are very competent and thorough, um, and you have the support of uh, uh, our police chief, so good luck, and I certainly will support that. Thank you very much. I, too, was impressed on how comprehensive your application and documentation was, and want to welcome you and thank you. Uh, this is a public hearing. Is there? Oh, I'm sorry, no, it's not. I'm not yet. Um, uh, so at this time, I'll entertain a motion from the board. That we accept the application as presented. Second. Second. Motion made seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Welcome. Good luck. Thank you very much. I appreciate I it. I hope you have a babysitter when you're going to tell them the meeting went to like 10. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, it's televised. <laughs> My wife knows when I get out of these meetings. <laughs> All right, agenda item number nine. A public hearing will be held to consider whether the license to sell alcoholic beverages held by Osborne Tavern LLC, doing business as Osborne Tavern, Joel Hartnett Manager, 49 Maple Street, should be suspended, revoked, or limited in any manner. I'd like to start with the police chief. Chief, would you, um, uh, if, if, the, if, with the board's indulgence, I'd like to uh, hear uh, both incidents and discuss them. Uh, and then move on uh, each uh, independently at the end. Thank you. So, Chief, if you would, wouldn't mind if you could go over the two incidences that you brought to our attention. All right, we have two incidents that occurred at Osborne Tavern on Maple Street, 49 Maple Street in town, uh, liquor violations. Both of them were, uh, the, the violations were uh, 204 CMR 2.05, permitting illegality on the license premise to wit, Mass General Law, Chapter 138, Section 69, sale or delivery of an alcoholic beverage to an intoxicated person. Both, uh, both of those were the same uh, violations. On November 2nd, at approximately 22, 28 hours, uh, officers responded to Osborne Tavern for a fight. Upon arrival, the fight was over. A large group of people were gathered outside. Um, the two agitators of the fight were identified and located. They had been walking away from the area. Both of the individuals, the male, a male and a female, were heavily intoxicated. The male was arrested on warrants. The female was subsequently placed into protective custody due to her intoxicated state. Uh, the shift manager or bartender at the time, uh, Christine Berg, did provide the officers <clears throat> with a copy of the bill for the um, two individuals. The bill indicated that there were six Coors Light 22-ounce beers, three Budweiser 12-ounce bottles, two Coors Light 12-ounce <coughs> bottles, and one Michelob Ultra 12-ounce. Uh, according to um, Ms. Um, Berg, the, the officer was informed that only the six Coors Light 22-ounce beers were consumed by the two individuals that had been um, um, taken into custody by the police department. That is the first incident. Thank you. The second incident occurred November 10th um, at approximately 2.52 a.m. in the morning. Officer John Melto was on patrol. He discovered a male party sleeping in his vehicle behind Osborne Tavern in the parking lot. The male party was heavily intoxicated, and it took a considerable amount of effort for the officer to uh, awaken him to get some sort of recognition. There was vomit that was observed outside the driver's door. The male party stated that he'd been drinking at Osborne's. Due to, the, to his intoxicated state, he was placed in a protective custody. He was given a, a, a portable breath test and it registered 0.147. Uh, a receipt from Osborne Tavern was provided by the individual that showed that he had been there. On November 15th, the, uh, Detective Clarizia spoke to the, uh, the same indi individual that had been uh, placed in a protective custody. 
the party stated that he and his five co-workers went to Osborne's around 5 p.m. He purchased a round of drinks, including Captain Morgan and Cokes and Jello shots. The receipt provided to the uh, police of booking, um, which is what was referenced. Each co-worker continued to purchase additional rounds throughout the night. Uh, the party stated that he had four beers and four be uh, Jello shots. Uh, he left the establishment, or the group left the establishment sometime after 10, and a co-worker had to walk him to his vehicle where he decided to sleep it off because he knew that he was too intoxicated to drive. Those were essentially the facts. Thank you. Just for clarification, Chief, um, I think you made a statement. That you just spoke, according to this, it was three or four beers and two jello shots. No, I have, I have four beers and four jello shots. Oh, okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, Great. Uh, I, I thank you. At this time, I would like to ask the, um, uh, the representative for Osborne Tavern to speak to one or both of the incidents, uh, and then I'll open it up to the uh, board for discussion and questions. Welcome. My name is James Cody. I'm here representing Osborne Tavern. I appreciate the opportunity to appear before you. Um, we have a couple of representatives also from Osborne. We have uh, Ken and Christina Berg, who were working at the Osborne Tavern at the time at least a second incident happened. Uh, I'd like to bring you up to date as to what has transpired as far as our policy uh, since the incidents, and Ken can speak to that, if you don't mind. Good evening. Thank you uh, for the opportunity to speak to you. Uh, my wife, Christina, and I were under an asset purchase agreement for the tavern, so uh, we had done a very extensive business plan, and as a result of some of these incidents, we sat down with Joel, the owner, and we decided to show him that there's certain things that maybe we should go ahead and implement from that business plan now. And these are some areas that we saw as uh, areas that had room for improvement. So some of the things we did was we immediately changed the size of their glassware. Um, we went from a standard 16-ounce glass to a 14-ounce glass. It doesn't sound like much, but when you fill it with ice, and we trained all the bartenders on the correct standard pour, which is about two ounces per drink, and so we corrected our pours. So the glassware and the pours uh, pretty much equals a much more responsible delivery of alcohol. Uh, we also kind of refresh the bartenders on their responsibilities in serving people under the TIP certification. Uh, I, we checked all the TIP certification and everybody was current. Um, and those are some of the things that, that we did to try to uh, navigate um, some of these issues. They've since been implemented. They're working very well. Uh, all the bartenders are very consistent with their pours now, a standard two ounce pour. So. Um, do you want me to speak to the jello shots at all? Uh, yeah. I'm gonna so, I mean, just also for the jello shots, um, I, I know there was some misunderstanding at one of the last meetings that I saw about the jello shot. Um, a jello <coughs> shot is served in a two ounce plastic cup. So, the recipe for that jello shot is one packet of jello, it's a cup of hot water, Thank you. a half a cup of cold water, and a half a cup of vodka. That mixture will yield about 12 of those two ounce cups, and we fill them about three quarters of the way. So essentially, the amount of alcohol in a jello shot is about a third of an ounce, and it would take about four, possibly five jello shots to equal a standard shot that when people buy a shot of whiskey, and standard shot's about an ounce and a half. So uh, if that helps you any with uh, some of the corrections we made. Can you let them know what would happen if there was too much alcohol in the mix? If there's too much alcohol in the jello shot mixture, it wouldn't gel. It would just be liquid. So Is that because uh, it's vodka? It, well, no matter what alcohol you use, any alcohol, well, alcohol would still, change. yeah, it would remain liquid. So there's such a minuscule amount per cup so that it still gels. So. Mr. Chairman, can I just ask a point of information? Yes, please. Um, of through Kent, when did you make these changes? Uh, these changes were implemented after the incidents occurred. Okay, thank you. And, um, okay. Mr. Chairman, we're here to hear about allegations for 
um, events that happened on November 2nd and 10th, not what's been happening since that time from s somebody else. Okay. Uh, I, I too have a question, which is, what is your relationship to the business? Uh, we were to under, the business of Osborne Tavern. Okay, it, it's twofold. One is we were under an asset purchase agreement. Uh, the second is that both my wife and I bartend down there. We've been bartending since August. We were graduates of the Boston Bartending School, and we're both TIPS certified. Okay. So I'm hearing that the uh, responses to the incidents. Um, is the inference that, uh, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, so I want to ask, you've taken corrective actions. Is that because there is, is there any dispute on the two incidences? Yes, there is. Okay. I'd like to hear that, please. I believe the chief uh, was before you on December 4th, and on terms of the first incident, not going back to the July incident. No, no, we're talking yeah. about the two most recent incidents. Uh, that there was a fight that evolved at the bar, but that a uh, representative of the, of, the, of the bar did call the police. Yes. Which is protocol. Yes. And the police did show up. So I believe as far as the protocol, we've met that. Christina Berg was on duty at the time. I can tell you that the three cores light were the only drinks that were purchased by the two individuals for their own personal consumption. She can also testify that two of the drinks were consumed, but the third, uh, the third were not, because the fight actually happened and they were dumped into the, into the sink. So as far as overserving, we don't believe that they were overserved at that particular time. The chief indicates in, through his reports and through the officer's reports that they were intoxicated. They were taken into custody, one of them for intoxication. I appreciate that. We don't have any uh, blood tests or breathalyzer tests for that particular incident. The gentleman was arrested on a warrant, and the woman was not arrested. She was, she was taken to protective custody for, oh, she for was PC. We, correct. So is your assertion that they were not uh, they were not overserved. Is that Correct. your assertion? Yes. Um, or that they were not intoxicated? I was not there. I can't say whether they were intoxicated or not. I can only tell you that they had were served two beers that were consumed at the premises. <clears throat> As we understand it from uh, from reading the reports in the last meeting, this was a number of people who got together, and that these obviously this the the all of the drinks purchased were not consumed by these two people, they gave them to friends. But we were led to understand that the friends also then took turns buying rounds. Oh, you're so, on the wrong case. No, oh, am I? That's the second one. Yeah, you're on the, so the second one. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah. I apologize. I, I have the two of them in. That's okay. I'm sorry, thank you for the clarification. No problem. Um, Chief, could you speak to the, um, to the how the uh, officers ascertained that, um, that, the, 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 that at least the woman was uh, uh, Intoxicated. How, how how police officers do their duty to to make that um, justification? Sure. By their observations and their trainings, and specifically, usually their OUI training for impaired driving, mm -hmm. whether they do field sobriety tests or not, not not necessarily. In this case, that wasn't the the issue. You just bear with me for yep. one moment. And while you're doing that, I actually was referring to this case when I said that there was a number of purchases that were not consumed. Six Coors Lights were bought, three Budweiser 12 ounces, two Coors Lights, 12 ounce bottles, a Michelob Light had been purchased. For friends, but- For friends, correct. Oh, I thought you meant um, by other coworkers, okay. so that was no, the other case. Okay. So there was a number here bought that were not consumed, I get that. So Chief, please go ahead. So in the police report, it specifically states that um, in regards to the female, the, the male was belligerent. Well, it doesn't say belligerent. He was yelling and swearing in front of the group. Um, and also that she was very unsteady on her feet, slurring her words and yelling. Um, a strong odor of, of an intoxicated beverage coming from her. And these are certain languages that need to be placed into a report to justify a protective custody under uh, the, the statute for an intoxicated person. We can't just allege something and then not uh, actually write 
the, the specific terms of what allows us to be able to place somebody into uh, protective custody by state law. So by the, the, the police officer's reports, um, they were intoxicated. They demonstrated or showed um, signs of, of uh, intoxication, such as slurring their words, unsteady feet, strong uh, alcoholic beverage on their breath. So it is documented in the, in the reports and gave the officers the justification to, to do what they did. Had the male subject not been arrested on the warrants, he was being placed under uh, protective custody because of his intoxicated state. Both of them were intoxicated. Thank Both of them were served alcohol while intoxicated. Alcohol was delivered to them while they were intoxicated. And by the time your Which officers reported, they were visibly intoxicated by, per your, your officer's professional um, observation? Yes. Thank you. Um, I'd like you to speak to the second, or if there's more about the first issue, great. Yeah, if, well, there is. Um, and Selectman Mills can, uh, will understand this. As a lawyer, we deal with evidence. We, there's no evidence here whatsoever that they were overserved. The buzz language used by the police are used in every police report that you'll read. There was no, nothing to say that they were served other than the two um, cause light. They were served three each. Two were consumed. One was not. We have Christina well, Berg. So first of all, this isn't a court of law with the same judicial constraints. I, I understand that, but innuendo also doesn't equal no. uh, I think we'll move past that. So if you have more... If, you, uh, if there are other identified items in this report that you uh, do not believe are accurate, we'd like to hear that. Well, again, if, if a law was broken, why was there no arrest? Why was there no breathalyzer giving, given? Again, I believe this is innuendo. We came here today in good faith, not knowing whether this was a lynching or a confession. I'll, I'll ask you not to use... I will use those words. I will, I will use those I will words ask you because not they to. were used by a selectman at the last and, meeting. Uh, sir, I'm going to ask you to not qualify in that manner. We are going to, we're acting now on the report and your response to that report, but not the, not the categorizations you're offering. Okay. My response also is, can you explain to me why a selectman on your board would call the, a, a, a legitimate business the scourge of the The selectman on the board has, has made their own statements. Each one of us make our own statements, and that person has... And, allow and me to finish, sir. That selectman, upon notification from your office and the review by our town council, has determined that he will not participate in the de debate this, this evening. The remaining four selectmen will ask questions of you and of the chief and will come to our individual observations. That gentleman has already identified to me separately, based on your communications, that he will not be speaking this evening and asking questions, and that, that is set aside. Well, I appreciate that. I wish we had known that at the beginning. I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have said that if there was an abstention. So we can move on to the second. Okay. Uh, moving to the second uh, incident, do you have uh, reason to believe there's errors or omissions or diff difference of a observation in the second uh, uh, um, Well, what I will say incident. is that, according to the timeline, the five individuals entered at f around 5 o'clock p.m. They clocked out at about 10 p.m. This individual was picked up at 2.30? Chief? Approximately. Approximately 2.30. That's over five hours of, of time that we can't... We don't know what he did to, during those five hours. He left the establishment. We don't know if he went across the street, down the street, had more liquor. We don't know whether he, he took a pill. We don't know whether he, he smoked marijuana. How are we supposed to control somebody five hours after they left an establishment? That's, that's a burden that no, no bar could ever meet. So the person, who, the person in question, first of all, I'd ask you not to make assert allegations about them, but they themselves said they bought alcohol at this location went to the truck, went to sleep because they were intoxicated at that point. That's the admission by the person who we're speaking about. That's their admission. So I... Are I, they here to... This is not a court of law, and this, this person was not... This is person, when they reach their day, if there is a court appearance before them, will be there. We're working on the observations of the officers, and I'd ask the chief to speak to that, please, sir. If I may, if it would please the board, the 
detective that did the actual um, interview with this person is, is present. It would please the board, sir, if you wouldn't mind. Good evening. Good evening. Could you please introduce yourself in case people don't know who you are? Yeah, Eric Clarizia. I'm uh, employed with the uh, town of Danvers as a uh, detective. Thank you, sir. And the incident that evening, or the inc when you interviewed the, the person we're speaking of? So I, I interviewed um, the person we're speaking of. The, the person was placed on the PC uh, on the 15th, about 6.30 in the evening. Um, and Eric, he, had, he had mentioned to me. I'm sorry. You spoke to him at six. I didn't get where the 6.30 in the evening. Oh, I'm sorry. Was, so on, on November 15th at about 6.30 p.m., I actually spoke with the person that was previously placed into protective custody. Okay. So I did my stuff on my investigation after the uh, the, you. the, okay. the date of the PC. Okay. And your observations, Detective? Yeah, so I, I spoke with him. He had mentioned that he went out with a group of coworkers, um, arrived at the uh, Osborne Tavern approximately 5 p.m. Uh, yeah, 5 p.m. right directly <clears throat> after work. Um, they each took uh, turns buying rounds of drinks. He had mentioned, um, you know, what his round that he purchased consisted of, which is in my report. Um, he believes that the last round was purchased between, I believe, 9.30 and 10 o'clock. They left the establishment approximately the same time. Uh, the group hung around outside of the, the premises. I believe there were smokers in the group for a short period of time. He mentioned to me that uh, he was walked to his vehicle, which was parked behind Osborne Tavern off of School Street by a co-worker. Uh, he decided that uh, he was going to sleep it off because he didn't feel comfortable driving. And he did admit to me that he felt that uh, he consumed too much alcohol that night at Osborne Tavern. Thank you. Could you remind us who are not in the profession, uh, when, he, when the breathalyzer was administered, um, 0.147. What is the legal limit for, for alcohol consumption? Well, if you're actually driving a motor vehicle, yep. uh, you couldn't be over a 0.08. 0.08. Right. And this was a 0.147. Right. And this was at 145, which was a number of hours, uh, almost four hours I after. believe it was later than that, because I believe Officer Melto, I, I, I wasn't on for, the, for Officer Melto's part, but okay. I believe he came in contact with him um, it's either 2 30 or 3 o'clock. But suffice so, to so say, alcohol, cons alcohol blood levels go down over time. It does. And at 10 o'clock when he left, it would be presumably higher than 1.45. Uh, 1. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, 0.147. Correct. Okay. Are uh, there uh, any questions for the detective while he's here? Just a, you, maybe you already said this. There's a breathalyzer for this person which was administered at what time, please? And again, I will say that I wasn't a part of the breathalyzer According to whatever portion of it, but uh, I can read off some Melto's <laughs> report. It was, he would, he would have, um, he came across him. Let me see if I can quickly find it. 2.52 in the morning, he came across him. He observed a, a, uh, a vehicle with its lights on in the back parking lot. So he made his observations. Let's see. The, uh, the, the BT was actually done back at the police station after he was placed into protective custody. It doesn't necessarily give an exact time here, and he blew a one point, uh, .147. Would have been after 3 a.m. Yeah, yeah I, my, my guess is it would have been after 3 a.m. It would have taken more than eight minutes to, you know, do your investigation, form an opinion, transfer him back to the station. There's, there is a booking process that, they, that we go through that maybe is 10 or 15 minutes long. So I think reasonably you could say between, say, 3.15 and 3.30 uh, would have been one, uh, 0.147, unless the chief has any other knowledge on that. So I'll ask the, uh, uh, sir, your representation. Is there any more points of clarity you wish to provide before I open to the board for discussion? Uh, no. Thank you. I'll sl start with Selectman Bennett. Sir? Um, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, 
not everybody was present during the fight, the police. I don't believe the Bergs were outside during the fight, is that correct? I was outside to answer questions. After, after the fight. After the fight. Thank you. Um, the fellow, the second incident, when he left and somebody walked into <coughs> his car, um, the suggestion that he perhaps drove away and got something else and then came back and parked in the same parking lot, I find hard to believe. So I have to assume that the fact that he was taken to his car and left there is, is a truthful statement. Um. So, and I'm still. No, no, I, I want you, I, before you answer that, sir, I want the gentleman to finish his discussion and his question. Thank you. And then we'll look to your answers. So, whether or not they consumed all the drinks that they bought or not is not relevant in my opinion. They were made a purchase, they were served. Whether they drank it or not, it has nothing to do with being over-served. And if somebody is already intoxicated and has served a drink, then they are intoxicated and they have been over-served, whether or not they finish that drink or not. And I'm sure there's many times when people don't finish a drink and leave it on the bar and depart because they've, in their mind, said, I've had enough. So this gentleman realized he was, in the second incidence, was intoxicated and did the smart thing and stayed in his car. And he was fortunate the police came, put him in protective custody for his own safety. And that's what this is all about. Safety in our community, safety on our streets. And that's where I'm coming from. And these are two incidents. A fight on the street is not safety in our community. And somebody sleeping it off in their vehicle in the back parking lot is not safety for our town and community. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, at his request, Selectman Clark has abstained from offering comment at this point. Selectman Mills. No further questions, thank you. Selectman Langlois. I also have no further questions, thank you. Um, so at this point, I, um, I believe if I've read and you can, uh, so is there any uh, uh, comment you wish to make about Selectman Bennett's uh, uh, observations? No, again, only that there's a, a, a vast expanse of time that occurred between being served and being found. And again, we have no idea what transpired during that period of time. Thank there you. has to be some weight to that. Uh, you know, we are in an opioid crisis. We don't know whether this particular I, I, I'm going to ask you not to cast allegations on the person that's not here. We are casting allegations on No, we are responding client. to the report of the police. We are not can casting Can you tell me, can, can the police tell me definitively what this happened person made a statement about five? What, this person made a statement about how he reacted, what he did, and on face value, I'm willing to take that. I'm willing to accept that in my deliberations. Uh, the other selectmen may choose to or not. This establishment has been run by the particular owners now for what? Four years? There have been no problems other than these, th these, these events. Uh, that's, one, been, that's actually inaccurate. We have a previous, in July, we have a previous uh, incident. And I discussed that okay. with you earlier. So there were three in a row. We, we, we admit that. Okay. But we've had a clean record prior to that, and so far, since then. Mr. Hartnett is an upstanding member of this community and does his best, he, he does his best in his role to make sure that these incidents don't happen. But they do happen. They happen with every establishment in town. That's not accurate, sir. We have many establishments who have not ever had a liquor license violation in this town. Okay. They happen to many establishments. They happen to a small minority of them. That, that's not, that's actually, that's not accurate. I'll, I'll, we won't so we can disagree that. on that. We try our best, and that's the only thing you can do. But in these two particular incidences, nobody was arrested. We haven't been told whether there were, uh, the keys were in the ignition of the gentleman's car, which would equate to an <coughs> OUI. No arrests. If this is such a serious matter, why were these people not arrested? 
Okay, so uh, those weren't points that you brought up. I have some questions, and maybe those I'll, I'll allow you to answer some of those because I have that. I have a discussion point on that. Um, so, but Selectman Bennett made some comments and some and some. Uh, um, uh, the, is there anything about his comments that you'd like to redress at this point? No. Okay. So I'll I'll enter my comments. I have a couple of questions. Who was the manager who that night on both of these incidents? I believe, and I'm asking for validation that it was uh, Ms. Burke uh, was the manager that night who was responsible for serving. On the second, okay. I mean on the first incident, yes. On the first, who was uh, responsible she on the second? She was not there on the second incident. Who was? Um, you were, Mr. Hartnett was. On, on, on the first incident, Christine was there because I was in California. Okay, and on the second can incident you, you were, yeah. could you go to the microphone, sir? So, uh, so people can get your comments on. Joel Hartnett, I'm the, uh, one of the principals of Osborne Tavern. Thank you. On the original incident, I was in California at a revealing party, by the way, and it yep. is a boy. And um, I had talked to Ken around 9 o'clock. He was on his way down to, to help out down there. And I think the incident, was it, what time did the fight actually start? Do you remember? Still after 9. Yeah. And, and, and what I understood was it started inside. The woman that the chief talked about had made her way to the ladies room with some comments and somebody asked her to just keep going to the bathroom please or to the ladies room and that's when her we thought was husband but I guess it's a boyfriend got involved with the people that didn't want to respond to her comments and this is life this is what happens and I believe the pushing probably started inside the establishment from what I had seen from the film Mm -hmm. Did it move outside? Yes, but in the meantime, she did the right thing. She did what you asked us to do. It was something that probably could have been handled like that. Maybe those people would have walked home. Maybe they would have got an Uber. But instead, I'm told by my help that four or five or six cruisers showed up. Now, I don't know what to believe what was sent for cruisers, but it was certainly a display of there's a problem down there that I don't think there's that much of a problem. I understand, send a cruiser, but it was, these incidences do happen <coughs> in places. I was at Walmart the other day and witnessed one in the parking lot. I, did, I didn't call the police because it was over in like 15 seconds, but it happens. And, and I don't believe those two people showed the fact that they were intoxicated when they were first served. Now somebody can come in and have been somewhere else for hours but you give them one or two more, yeah, like Dan said, they, it, that's a judgment they need to help us with too. I've had enough, let's go home. That's probably why they never finished the third one. Uh, the second instance, so I was asking first who was the manager at the time, and I understand right. that you were the manager of the first instance. Who was the manager at the time? Who was in the presence, the premise at the time I, of the second I instance? was in that building most of the evening, starting, okay. starting from about seven o'clock. Okay. These five individuals are very well known to me. Mm -hmm. I did not ask them to come here tonight because they all have very good jobs. This isn't and, about them. Exactly, but I do, I do know what their habits are like. And the young man in question had left once at 6.30. He was not feeling good. They have stressful jobs. They have big-time jobs. They do play a little hard. He had gone out to his car. He hadn't eaten all day. Things were wrong in the business that they're all in. He came back in, and I did not see him consume another drink of alcohol. Mm -hmm. There was one, one girl with them, actually, from the same, same company. He did tell me during my investigation that he went out to his car and called an Uber, sat in his car, fell asleep, and the Uber could not find his car. And the reason he knows this is because he got billed for the ride. So then he went back in, clowned around, talked to his friends about it, and probably assumed one of them were gonna give him a ride home, but he must have looked fine to them by then. But what else occurs out, out there? I can't, I can't be out there policing every car. Is somebody out there smoking pot? Yeah, probably. <coughs> we could probably check every parking lot at night and find that. I don't know what this individual did in that time span, and I can't believe his friends would have left him there if he was that bad. Now, if, he came, if the police <clears throat> found him at 2.30 with that car running, I'm under the assumption either he came back to that car 
or he went somewhere in that car and came back to that parking lot to sleep it off. I'm not sure. But I have spoken well, to him. Well, according to his own words, that was not the case. I understand. Those his, were his in, words. In his and his words if he is to well me known, was that he ordered an Uber and he missed it. Correct. And, 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 and the, to me, that's not the germane part of this. The germane part of this is the over-serving part of it, as Selectman Bennett has said. It wasn't about whether he was seen in his car. It wasn't about that there was vomit on the side. It wasn't about that he slept it off or his friends brought him outside and they smoked some cigarettes. It was about the statement that the individual made himself that he felt he was, oh, he was intoxicated, too intoxicated to drive after being at the, at, the, at the establishment. When I spoke to him, he told me he was intoxicated because of a stressful day at work and he hadn't eaten in 24 hours. Grant, and, he, and he realized that he was sick. Yep. <coughs> so you, obviously, the manager of Reckon were at the second event. Who's the, uh, uh, but who are the managers of, rec according to the, um, our records, right. Ms. Berg is not a manager of record. No, because of the recent application coming up, I hadn't put her on because she had just started working. But there are me. two other assigned names. They weren't in the building. No. So they were, in, one does the morning shift and one sometimes okay, so, in the so afternoon. So the point I'm making is there was no identified manager of record in the building at the time. I was in the building. No, no, the first event. The first event was? The first event with Ms. Berg was there. The, did I run down here before I went to California and tell Joe that I have another manager? No, I didn't. I'm, another guideline. I'm sorry, but I didn't, I did, it didn't really cross my mind to do it. Uh, Ken, Ken's a retired police officer. I, I know his mm -hmm. wife. I've gotten very friendly with them. They've been working for me for four months, five months now, working for me and with me. And I was very comfortable with leaving them there. Um, my two partners who aren't here tonight stop in. They can make a decision. I'm sorry they're not here, but they're not here tonight. I was the person that couldn't make it on the 4th. I apologize to the board, but I could not make it. It was the type of situation I just and, couldn't. And, and, we've, and, and God we and dealt, with that. About it. dealt with that. That's not but germane was, to this was, either. If, if, this if is, your question, this um, to, to answer your question, I was, I was very happy that while I was in California, they were there. In but the question wasn't whether you were happy. The question is, was there a manager of record on the premises at all times? And the answer really is no. Right. In the first incident, the right. answer is no, um, despite the guidelines that say that there should be and that, you know, and that even in an and, and identified designates, can, you can just come down and sign up with the, with the clerk who the designates are. There's no vetting process that we have uh, for those designations. You know, my, my mistake, I mean, I left. Uh, I probably could have done it on a late Thursday night when mm -hmm. town halls open till 7. But Friday, I was un in a plane, and I know I, I didn't do it. Okay. I didn't sign them as, up as managers, but I think, and I understand the guidelines. And I'm telling you, we followed the guidelines when we called the police about the incident. You did. So I asked that question specifically because of the incident that happened previously. I want to make sure. Yes, you did. You followed one of the guidelines. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll be the first to state I, I, I'm not weighing my factors based on that. You did follow that guideline, of which there are many, mm -hmm. and we've heard one that you did follow, and we've heard one that we didn't follow by having an assigned manager, mm -hmm. and now there's further discussion. <coughs> so the discussion about why weren't they arrested, we rely on our police department to show police discretion all the time. I know, and <laughs> from previous officers have been caught. I might go more than 35 down portions of High Street and police discretion allows to either write me a ticket or not. They look at all the factors surrounding the incident at the time and they use their professional uh, skills and their professional discretion to either apply the full weight of the law, some weight of the law, or allow for um, uh, situational uh, accommodations. In the first incident, someone was arrested on a warrant. Had they not, they would have been taken into protective custody, and the second person was taken into protective custody based on the opposite professional observation that they were intoxicated by police uh, uh, professionals who do this for a living and are trained in that observation. The second incident, this person admitted, and the, and the Report states the keys were in the car, and yes, if they applied the full weight of the law, I'm certain that person could have had many more charges brought against them. 
Police discretion is an important part of being a community police officer, a community professional. And you don't always apply the full weight of law for every single instance. And so I respect the fact that, and, and appreciate the fact that this could have arrested your friend who had a very bad day in a very bad situation, who hadn't had anything to eat. But I know that if I go out and drink and haven't eaten all day, I'm more likely to succumb to alcohol sooner than if I'd have a full meal. We all are. Yeah. So I'm hearing that person admit he came to the bar right from work, drank at the bar with his friends, which we all have do in, in, on occasion, and felt so, felt en enough not in control that he sat in his truck. And hours later, he was still well over the, 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 the legal limit of intoxication, hours and hours later, to suggest he, after saying himself, I am too drunk to drive, I'll even call an Uber and missed it, to suggest he left in that truck, went someplace, and then returned in that truck to the same location doesn't seem a, a credible story to me. And I appreciate the well, fact that there are potential alternatives. I, I but wasn't I'm, totally indicating that he left in the truck, but, but downtown Danvers, as it grows with more establishments, he <coughs> certainly could have one other could bar. Have, could have in, we have else. one other alcohol. Uh, uh, the, no, Chuck's serves, and um, Berry serves. Hong Kong Cafe. Okay. And Nine Elm. All really within not walking relevant. distance. Okay. That's not uh, relevant. But, but this person himself stated this is what he did. If he had stated, I went to someplace else, but he himself okay. had made those statements. I, I'm willing to believe that the person himself is making the statements, is being truthful about them. I'm willing to believe, and I'm, I'm positive that the obs professional observations of the police officers are, are relevant, and, um, and even when they did do blow, blow a breathalyzer. And again, it, doesn't, it has nothing to do with whether he was out in his truck, whether he was arrested or not. It was, was he overserved? Was he visibly and demonstrably um, impaired and still served? And we heard in the first instance that the third beer was taken off the bar and poured down when they got into a fight. But again, to the point that you get into the third beer and to the point where this person himself is self-identifying as being too intoxicated, there has to be some, some thought that is, that is that noticeable and demonstrable? Now, I know, um, w were you doing the serving when you were in, in, the, in the bar room on the second? No, the second? I just simply bar back. Okay. Yeah, so... so so it would have fallen on the bartenders to be yeah. responsible and, and, and cognizant of that. But I did speak with them multiple yep. times. Sure, sure. They're known to me. I've been in your bar and you and I speak too. Yeah. There's no yeah. doubt about it. This so, is a small town. So people are going to talk, you know, so people talk about, oh, did you go, do you, do you patronize certain places? Do you know certain people? We all know many of the people in the town. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, and I, I, I know what goes on in bars constantly and consistently. Um, so rather than take up any more of your time, I don't know what people do when they go to their cars. That's the only other plea I have, okay? And we talked a minute ago about the discretion of the police, <coughs> and they were probably a little lenient on this. <coughs> if that car was running and that young man didn't get a DUI, they were probably a little lenient. I don't lenient. think they said it was, uh, I don't know. It I, was I, in the first report. Okay. Okay. In the first report, when the chief got up okay. there and said the car was running, okay. there was some discussion at 12.30, 2.30, 3.30, and I understand it's police work. They're busy at night, and I understand that. But the same discretion they use, and my last comment to this board is, I hope that's the same discretion I get tonight, too. It's a judgment call. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any more comments by the board members before I open it up for the public hearing? Sure. So so again, I'm just going to go back to the chief on this. Um, the charges on both is uh, delivery of an alcoholic be beverage to an intoxicated person. And I just want to clarify, because this isn't, like you had said, this isn't driving intoxicated. So is the definition under the state law that it can be the skills that the police officer has of glassy eyes, uh, wobbly feet or slurred, or does it have to be a measurement? Um, what is the definition under the state law of an intoxicated person? 
It's a combination of everything that the officer observes. The physical, uh, the traits that, that uh, the person that had been drinking has, that, whether the slurred speech, the unsteadiness, uh, um, the smell of the, the alcohol, all these things roll together. There are observations some, on some of the other things of the surroundings, you know, like the gentleman that was in the car and vomited in the area. Um, and in placing them into protective custody, it's not a criminal, that's not a criminal violation. Being intoxicated is not a crime. Right? And that's why we were given the protective custody law a, a long, long time ago. And that was to take people that were intoxicated off the street and to put them into a safe place so they don't, they don't harm themselves or others. I mean, ultimately, they say they want you to bring them to a hospital first or a detox, and the police station is the last resort. But we all know that the detoxes don't take them, and that, neither do the hospitals, so the police department gets them. So that's why we have them housed at the police department, and then so, we have to make sure that we watch them throughout the course of time. And also, it was part of the breath test requirement. We're allowed to offer a breath test. They, they're not required to take it, and we can't demand them that they take one. In most cases, they don't take a BT. So, th so I just want to clarify as we move forward. So, under the state regulation, unlike this is not driving under. So, I, you know, I, I heard that being said. It's two different things. So, the officer's observation fits within the state law of what an intoxicated person is. Within the description of what an intoxicated person okay. is, yes. Thank you. All set. Yes, thank you. And here, the question from board members before I open it to the public. This is a public hearing. Is there any member of the public who would like to speak to this incident, no, to this issue? Seeing none. Motion to close the public hearing. Motion made to close the public hearing. Do second. I hear a second? And a second. second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? No. Thank you. Uh, we've closed the public hearing portion of this. Is there some other statement, one more, sta uh, another statement you'd like to make <clears throat> in this I regard? Would, I would just like to ask that if the board is going to impose more than a one day suspension, that it be stayed to allow us to appeal? You always have the right to appeal to the ABCC. We don't have to make that statement. Thank you. No, no we have the right to appeal, but the suspension would still be <coughs> valid. We need the board to stay the, stay the suspension until the appeal is heard. We will, we will make our, we will make our uh, whatever decision we make, and, you, and, the, and I believe, if it's not the, to Mr. Clark, that if they appeal to the ABCC, that um, the, the, the suspension is held until that appeal is heard. Is that correct? That would be up to the ABCC, but as far as any, any appeal, our office will notify the license holder in writing of the action that is taken, any action that is taken by the board this evening, mm -hmm. and they will, once upon receipt of that letter, they have five days to appeal any decision that the board made to the ABCC. So we'll follow those state guidelines. We I don't think we have to make a declarative statement. We will say that we will not impose a date to these prior to your opportunity to appeal. Thank you. So there are three actually actions that I'd like to discuss with the board and, and have them take up individually if it's the will of the board. The first being the action relating to the original first incident that happened um, and we heard in September uh, where a one day lice, uh, uh, a violation occurred. We deliberated and gave the um, liquor license holder a one day um, uh, suspension held in abeyance for one year. Um, uh, and the, the other, and if you feel this sufficient way to the others, that we should consider the abeyance at this point. Is that Well, are we doing each one separately? Yes, so I'd like to start with that. I'd like to make a motion that the one day suspended be served. Thank you. There's a motion on the, on the, uh, to have the one day suspension we previously gave to be served. Do I have a second on the motion? Well, can, I'll second it just to say something. Sure. Thank you. So we haven't found a second offense yet, so that do you want to go in reverse order? I think we have to because that's only if there's been a violation found within a year. Good point. And I don't wanna, I yep. just don't wanna so we'll take number two mistake. first Perfect. and leave number yeah, one for right. last. Right. Let's just not make it. So I would, like to, I would like to ask the, if you'd like to make a motion on the incident. Um, I want to get them right. So, uh, Please. so now we do have a first offense that's been 
in suspension. And we'll, we'll deal with so that. So this, this is like, but this is a second offense. Correct. That we're, do, we're talking about for November 2nd, yep. 2018. And a second offense, the uh, suspension can be three to 14 days. I have my local license file. Well, that's what I, I, okay. I, I already... Thank you. If you have it, then you know the answer. Three, three to <laughs> 14 days. So uh, on the second offense, I make a motion that there be five days license suspended. The motion's made for a five-day suspension specifically based on the second offense um, of November... Second. Second. Thank you. I just want to be clear. Yep. Um, do I hear a second to the motion? I'll offer a second for the sake of discussion. Yeah, and, and uh, I just will offer the amendment that we're allowed to hold that in abeyance. We, we are? If you, are you going to offer that yes. as an amendment? There's an amendment to hold the five-day suspension suggested in abeyance uh, based on other incidents. Um, are there any discussions on? Yes, Mr. Mills. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> I'm persuaded that the... Um, police have sufficiently presented evidence to warrant a finding um, of violation on each of these November incidents. Um, this is not a criminal court, so the evidence need not be proved beyond a reasonable doubt as the Perry Mason um, lessons would teach us. <clears throat> the licensee is responsible Finding, if we do, violations does not mean intentional violations. It means violations that happened while the licensee was responsible for supervising the sale and furnishing of alcoholic beverage. Um, one of the things that occurs to me is that if there is a pending sale and a transfer, I would not want anything that the board does to abort that transfer because that's a pretty serious punishment for these violations. In other words, to undo uh, something that's happening by way of business. I wouldn't want to do that, to hurt that. I don't know, that's just my imagination because I don't want that to happen. Um, I don't see how it would if you have the two people who are the potential transferees of the business who are here, who work there, who have been somewhat present during these violations. So I'm also feeling that five days um, is severe. Um, and I'm just finding five days severe. That's what I wanted to say. And also, if Mr. Cote would have anything to say about whether or not action that is taken by the board to uh, suspend would have an impact. I'm not saying that it would. You'd have to have a pretty good argument that it would have an impact upon some asset transfer. I'd like to know that. Uh, I don't know. I, I will say uh, one moment. Before you go there, I'm going to allow you to answer, but uh, Select my Mills, I would respectfully disagree that we're talking about A's establishment that's currently working, the fact that they may or may not be selling, the fact they may or may not be transferring, I think is independent of our decision, but you have every right to ask the question, and I'll ask uh, the representative to, to answer that. Thank you, Selectman Mills. I, I can't speak for the, for the birds as to whether or not this would, would make a difference. I just can tell you that a five or six day shutdown, essentially, you will end Osborne Tavern. They will have to shut down. The comments made by one of your selectmen on the December 4th meeting has already cost us business. A five or six day shutdown, it's over. Mr. Chairman, can, yes, I, please. can I ask the clerk, a, thank you, sir. Yes. Can I ask the clerk a question? So um, I have no idea with our regs, I couldn't find it, whether in something held in abeyance transfers to a new owner? No. I don't think so. Mr. Clark? I am not a lawyer. Right. Uh, and I would seek advice of town council. Yes. Okay, thank you. And if I may, Mr. Chairman, yes. we did not 
we did issue their license for next year. They have, that premise has a license to operate on. We're talking about suspension mm -hmm. or for a set amount of time to be served at some time in the future by that establishment. Mm -hmm. uh, I, and I, uh, so we have a motion, we have an amendment to the motion, I, and uh, Selectman Mills offered the, uh, his comments uh, uh, to that motion. I will also say I think that five <coughs> um, for the second was uh, on the far side of where I was thinking. I was thinking three. Well, I started at seven and came down. Uh, okay, I'm just saying so, my, my, my thought process, We all, again, we all have independent thought process. That's why we're, you know. The minimum is three anyways. All right. So I'm, I'm considering three in consideration of the fact that I believe the sufficient issue for the, the third incident and, you know, that, that weighs into the overall. Um, you're suggesting five. Uh, you, your amendment is to hold that into abeyance. That's the motion on the uh, motion at the moment. I need a second. And, oh, do we need a second on the um, amendment? I'm going to withdraw that amendment okay. because um, I think that we should put them together. Um, I think at the end we should put them together, right, but I think I we do. need to address each one okay. separately. And I'll tell you why, Diane. It's... The second fence is 3 to 14, the third is 7. Yep. The, so the, um, cause, we're going to have to find a number that's... Am I allowed to still speak? Okay. Sure. I, I didn't know where we were at. I'm getting confused. Well, so right but... now the motion has been made on the first <coughs> offense to well, do five days, Yep. no amendment, but if it's the will of the board to bundle the last two incidents together, and I still think we should think about the third one independently because it has a different clock. We should. Now. Then, if it's the will of the board to combine the two, yeah. um, if you would like to make a motion relating to the two, uh, I'm happy to hear that as opposed so, to going. I'm going to tell you how I really feel. Yep. Um, I really feel that the November 2nd, I just have to keep myself. Uh, the November 2nd one, there was a fight, they called the police. Now she acted like an idiot, and I get really upset at that. So um, I'm not really, you know, I, all right, we, you know, we, we said that to them last time. So that one, you know, I'm not going to say that 322-ounce beers wouldn't put somebody under, but, you know, they call the police. I've seen no proof that the person out in the parking lot was... Well, that's the, was that's the second one. That's the, see, I yeah, keep getting my November, dates. Yep. No, that's November 10th is the one in the parking lot. Yep. So right, that's, that's the second one. Um, I, I see nothing <coughs> that says that that person, nobody's proven to me that they weren't served last at Osborne, that, you know, that there's no way that was four cause lights and four jello shots throwing up, you know, five hours later. So that's why I don't think we have three offenses. I think there's really one in this and the fighting, you know, I understand the over serving, but um, they called the police, they did what they were supposed to do, and it was the patrons that acted like idiots. Well, I'd agree that they did what they were supposed to do in calling right. the police. I, I disagree that they did what they were supposed to do because I, I firmly feel they overserved yeah, the I'm, patrons I'm not, who ran into, who had a fight. Yeah, I'm not. One doesn't that negate one's the a gray other. That area for me. The, the second one is the one that I say I, I have seen no proof that that didn't happen. So if we're going to combine incident on the two incidents in November, the fight on the second, the person in the truck on the tenth. Does someone have a motion as to the ultimate? Well, if we're going to combine them, yep. then I'm going to be looking at seven days okay. combined. So there's a motion. So That's a motion. We still have my original motion. Right. So, so are you if, going to change So it? if you want us to address both together. I'm asking the board's discretion. Which would you like to do? Ask my colleagues at the right. Do they want to take them both together? Do you want to together? take them both together and have... One, <coughs> findings. one finding for the two November incidents. And by the way, the reason we're deliberating, the reason this is uh, uh, difficult for us is we've never had a condition in the 13 years I've been on the board where we've had an establishment have three liquor violations come before us, found to be completed or not, within the course of a six-month period, ever. We've never, as I can, I can recall, that we've never had any establishment under the same management come before us with three liquor, liquor violations? Thank, ever. Good, thank goodness. 
Thank goodness. Now, so, but we're here tonight. Yeah, we're here tonight, so you're, um, so, are we going to, so board yes. members, are we, are we willing to address There's the a consensus. two members? Is that the consensus? I, I think it makes sense okay. So right. the consensus is we're going to deal with the so two then my, members. So then well. my, mo my motion is mute. So I would make a motion that we have a seven-day suspension for the two offenses, November 2nd and November 10th. There's a motion on the floor for To be seven served as soon as the appeal period is over. Thank you. Motion on the floor for seven days uh, to be served after the appeal process has, has run its course. Is there a second on the motion? I'll second it for discussion purposes. Um, I would actually think that um, I would be willing to, uh, <coughs> I, I, I see seven as a, a large number. I don't think it's um, out, of the, out of the park. I would actually suggest, I would actually, and I'm throwing this out for discussion purposes, <coughs> like to see three served, four held in abeyance. My concern, however, holding this in abeyance for someone, you know, uh, uh, well, I vacillate. I was going to say that. We don't uh, know if that the new ownership, if there is one. But again, one. we're also, <coughs> uh, and I was going to go there, yep. but I'm also of the mind that this is independent of new ownership in the future. Um, as, I, as I made the comment to Slackman Mills. That I don't think that that should weigh in our deliberations. Would it hurt new ownership, or would they, you know? And we've had in the past violations held in abeyance where the abeyance clock ran out, or the abeyance <coughs> clock they transferred before the abeyance clock went out, you know, to another owner. Um, so I'm not sure that that's going to weigh into mine. My feeling would be three days served uh, on these two. The other four <coughs> held in abeyance. That would be my thought, Mr. Mills. I'm just thinking about the three days, I'm comfortable with that. Abeyance for four, I'm comfortable with that. Just wondering if the three days could be other than consecutive. For example, three Mondays, as opposed to oh, just. We have the right to make that recommendation. Um, I'm, I'm looking to the clerk and he's nodding. Our guidelines allow us to stipulate when they are served. Obviously, the days that the business is normally <coughs> closed, we wouldn't ask for that. Um, we could ask for a weekend. We could ask for not a weekend. We have the latitude to suggest when the service happens. So we're training like a barber shop. They close Mondays. Yeah, that's not reasonable. No, no, no I agree. Dan, I'm sorry. I say to, to suggest that we give them suspensions on Mondays. I don't think is reasonable. I think we need to be a little more um, understanding of the severity of the violations and that the punishment should reflect the severity of the indiscretion to a degree. I mean, certainly I'm not going to advocate for the full 14 days on the second and 30 on the third. That's not reasonable, even though it's in our purview. So I think there should be some number significant more than three. I also think that it should be held consecutively. And I think if we come up with a number that it should be served immediately following the appeal period so that it's out of the way, it's over. If these had happened two months apart, we would have been dealing with the second, we would have given something, then they would have been back before us for the third offense and we would have been locked into having to start with a minimum of seven days based upon our regulations. But if we're taking the two together, and we come up with a number that's reasonable and matches the severity of the infraction, I think that's proper. Then, given the discussion, I would offer an and it's for the, still Can discussion. Please go ahead. Are you talking three days plus the one day? That's I'm not, I'm not even on that one. That's not even on that one. Right. Um, <laughs> we're talking about the two November incidences combined. Dan's offered an amem a, a, a motion for seven days. I would ask, uh, I would entertain or make an amendment if, if the board members don't want it. Three days served immediately after the appeal to be served consecutive days um, that the business is open, the four days held in abeyance for one year, um, uh, for the one year abeyance period that we normally hold. Uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't vote for that. What, what, what would you, what would you, what do you? Five days. I 
I still don't know if the first offense is included in that. No, no it's not. No, it's so not. Then we have to go back and add. Correct. So that would be four and four. Right. You want to determine that we you had a to... violation, so we'll put, that's right. off the table okay. until we determine these two. Yeah. So I'm at five days for the both. Five days total, so you total. Not, not seven. Not seven. Okay. Five total to be served. Okay. So there is a, um, so the revised amendment, uh, the revised motion, no amendment, is to, by the original person who made the motion, five days. Five day suspension. There's a motion and I've seconded it for this, the sake of discussion. What's the discussion by the board? So, a compromise. Sure, I'm, that's why we're here. I'm, I'm a little concerned about the sale, but I guess that's just not our problem. Um, that's all timing, too. So I think three days, if we're going to serve something consecutively three, and then if you want to hold the four, so a total of seven. So three, including the first offense, and four in abeyance. I well, I, the reason I'm holding off on the first offense is that's not appealable. Right. The first offense was one so day you could held in abeyance. Two and four, and then we'll go back and um, take that first one, because that one has to be served. There's nothing that we're going to stop that. That one. As long as we determine there's sufficient facts here. If, if, unless yep. we're going to vote and say that there's no offense here. Mm -hmm. Right. So I think that we should do. Um, I think we should do uh, two and four. And hold the first offense. We'll come back to that, but I'm going to ask them when that we go back to the first one that it be added to the two, so that it's consecutive. Because it, that seems to be the goal is to get some consecutiveness out of this. Am I confusing the heck out of everybody? No, okay. not at all. Um, but that, I just uh, oh, we could. So Dan's motion's for five. It's started. So you're saying it should be six. Two held. Two. Held, uh, I'm sorry. Two to serve. Three to be held in abeyance. Uh, four to be held in abeyance. Yeah, I'm going to agree to the four in abeyance. I, in, in order to get the immediate serving down. I can support that. So you would suggest that five. Diane suggesting six, of which there's two served, four in abeyance. Your thoughts? I won't vote for it. Uh, what are you looking for? Uh, serve. Uh, is five your number to serve? Three. S serve three and the balance and abeyance. I agree with three and the balance and abeyance. So three to be served. Three and three. I, uh, Diane's gone to six. You, you yeah, three. Well, yeah, that's fine. So so three to be served immediately after the appeal period, and three held in abeyance on these instances of November second and tenth. So that's the motion at the moment. <laughs> Sorry, Joe. Um, so the current motion, <coughs> as revised by the person. And I'll second that. The total number is six for the two November incidents. Three to be served, three to be held in abeyance. Are there more discussions on that motion? Selectman, Selectman Bennett. Bennett made the motion, motion and I've seconded it. Is there more discussion on that motion? No. All right, the motion before us is for the two incidents in November combined the penalty that we're in, uh, imposing is six days total, of which three will be served after the appeal process clock, immediately after the appeal process, for business hours, and three to be held in abeyance for one year. All in favor of that motion, say aye. 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 Opposed? It passed four to one, uh, four to zero. Uh, I'm sorry, one four abstention. with one abstention. Thank you. Now we return to the previous incident <clears throat> We're calling incident one uh, that happened back in uh, July. July, when which this board uh, heard the, fi the findings of the police, worked with the uh, uh, liquor license owner, and the suspension at that time was one day held in abeyance for one year <coughs> if there was no other incidents in one year. So I make a motion that they serve it consecutive with the other days, one day. Okay. So at this point, I'm actually going to ask the clerk for a clarification. Um, Mr. Clerk, we made a motion, um, and the appeal process would have allowed for the applicant to appeal that one-day suspension held in the bans, and that appeal process passed. Um, so that's in effect. 
do we need to, or is it prudent for us to make uh, to to um, uh, to make a motion at this point, or just say we're imposing that one day? That would be up, in my opinion, Mr. Chairman. That would be up to the board's discretion. Okay. I think to err on the side of caution, I would agree, and we should make that motion. I just wanted to double check. Thank you. Um, there is a motion to initiate the one the the one day suspension we previously held, uh, offered and to have it served consecutive to the three days of the of the last mr chairman yes. uh, just as a point of clarification if that if that's the motion that's made and supported if the and i would probably ask the clerk this if the decision that was just made is appealed and is successful and the one day that will be imposed is being uh, made contingent with the other days. I'm curious what would happen in that in that case if no date is set. To the, to the, to that other Just the day. I'm sorry. The day will be served after the previous, and not part of. Well, but follow to follow. So if the appeal, if the if there's an appeal and the appeal prevails, then the question is when that day would be imposed. Yeah. I believe. Maybe I, that's I what I'm asking. I think the position should be separated. I'm agreeing with the. Okay. How do you want I, to separate them? Well, you just say one day to be imposed and pick a day. Yeah, and now that it, we've gone to three days, I think we should just leave that one alone, separate. Now that we've, because now As we're going to do four days, right? Because four days is a lot, and we have already agreed that three days. We we held. Well, no, we agreed days. on those two. We and we yeah. didn't clarify. Now that you've gone to three days, I think that you need to leave the one day. Yeah, we should have stayed at five. Now. Well, and, and I'm going to disagree. From my perspective, is we gave a one day held in abeyance. Mm -hmm. They were unable to, uh, they, they had another violation. I think that we've made a ruling, we should stick <coughs> to that ruling. Right. And I think, I, I think we should have the one day served. Right. I don't think we should tie it to That's what that I just other. Said. Oh, okay. I thought you were saying forego the one day. Oh, no. I just said, let's, oh, oh, let's I misunderstood what you were saying. I apologize. January okay. or something and so I just say we have it served oh, and, and, um, and choose if you want to oh, choose a date or a day oh. of the week. That's fine. First week of January? First week of January. So the motion is made to ask uh, to to reinstitute our one day suspension to be served the first week of January uh, on a normal business hour day, uh, you know, one uh, normally open on. Is that an accurate that's, that's fine. of what yeah, you intend? That's fine. I'll second that. The motion's, yep, Mr. Mills? Perhaps the option of the licensee to choose the day of the week? They can, as long as it's a business hour. Okay. We're not. We're not. I didn't stipulate a day. A day, day just out of the first day in January, first week, okay. a regular Before business the day. Only open. Do you have any uh, motion made and seconded? Any other comments on the motion? All right. Uh, all in favor of that motion? Aye. 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 Opposed. Again, four with Same. one abstention. Uh, so that will be served without appeal the first week of January um, at the owner's discretion. Uh, for a business day that they normally open. Uh, that concludes the hearing uh, that we had before us. Thank you very much. We appreciate you <coughs> coming uh, to all the parties. <clears throat> Agenda item number 10, the board will consider a vote to adopt the budget policy for fiscal year 2020 as reviewed by the school committee and the library trustees. Mr. Town Manager. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you received a copy of the draft budget policy tonight. This was distributed uh, to the board in early November, and at the time it was also uh, distributed to the library uh, uh, board of trustees as well as the school committee. Uh, we got word back um, last week and early this week um, that both uh, trustees and the school committee support uh, the policy as, as written. And um, so I would look to the board now. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions. This is uh, uh, substantively the same as last year's policy and I, outlining the, the long-term goals and strategies that we uh, use uh, during the budget process. Thank you. Um, I will start with Selectman Clark for this one. I have no questions. I'm in support of it as presented. Thank you. Uh, Selectman Mills. I think it's beautifully presented. And I think, isn't this what worked last year? <laughs> well, then let's look for another good. It's like when I was. I follow David on these issues. 
And I, uh, I, I, I've reviewed it, and it's, uh, I have no question. Oh, I'm sorry. I no, second that. That's fine. No, no. Second minute. And I have no other edits or to offer, so I'll accept a motion on the 2020 budget policy. I move that we accept the budget policy for fiscal year 2020 as presented. So motion made any, and seconded. Any more discussion on the motion? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Thank you. All right. Agenda item number 11, the board will consider to vote to close the warrant for the February 4th, 2019 special town meeting. Mr. Town Manager. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, as the board knows, we are working uh, to prepare uh, okay. materials for a special town meeting on February 4th to consider the Smith School project. Uh, as, as part of our process with each uh, town meeting, uh, we need to close the warrant at some point. Uh, and the recommendation tonight would be that uh, the board vote to close the warrant on Friday, uh, the 28th of December uh, at noon. And at this point, uh, the only other item that we have uh, for the special town meeting um, is a request to appropriate additional Chapter 90 funding that was released by the state. And we'd like to address that in February so that the money can be used uh, for the road uh, reconstruction season starting this spring. Uh, we don't believe there will be any budget transfers or other uh, matters of business that we bring, need to bring before. Uh, town meeting on the fourth. So, Mr. What was Chairman, the date of the warrant? so we would be uh, proposing that we close the warrant uh, December twenty eighth. December twenty eighth. The next week uh, at noon, which is a Friday. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. You to the um, town manager. Chapter ninety. Is that any additional funds or just a payment for this, this year? Release of some additional funds. Uh, the uh, governor above and beyond. Correct. What we, okay, great. Yep. There was a part of the budget surplus um, yep. this year. The governor. Uh, uh, voted, uh, signed a bill to release additional Chapter 90 funds to towns and cities. So we we will have. Did, a, did he get up to 300 or? We we've not gotten to 300. We will continue to push for that. Okay, thank you. Any other uh, questions? And, um, so I'll entertain a motion to close the warrant on. December so moved. Second. Uh, <coughs> any discussion on the motion? Just a reminder: any citizens who want to uh, consider a, a warrant. Uh, that they seek uh, the guidance of the town clerk um, uh, how to appropriately do so. Uh, and the deadline will be with this vote December 28th at noon. Motion on the floor. Any other discussion on the motion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you very much. The town manager will report to the board on various items of interest. Mr. Town Manager. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. In, in the uh, continuing the theme of budget, um, I'll report that we've, uh, the finance team uh, has been working uh, hard. We've, been, we've met with the majority of the uh, town's departments to review uh, their proposed operating budgets and capital requests for FY20. Uh, we'll be sitting down on January 7th, which is the day before the next selectman's meeting uh, for the first of the budget team meetings that, uh, with representatives from the schools and the library where we'll review um, the big picture budget outlook uh, in all three uh, town departments, and we'll also be talking about some of the uh, cost drivers in the budget uh, in terms of where we are with, with health care, uh, uh, the, the retirement contributions as determined by the town's actuary, um, debt service, and some of the other items. So uh, we're, we're well underway, and with the policy in place, um, we'll be able to, to uh, apply that as we start to make uh, critical decisions about uh, what to propose in the budget. Uh, there was a question at the last meeting. Uh, Assistant Town Manager Jim Breaker was here to um, uh, seek the support of the board to negotiate our Verizon uh, renewal. And uh, there was a question raised. There, have, there are some, uh, some draft regulations that have been proposed uh, by the FCC uh, that would, that would uh, have a detrimental impact on uh, these agreements really across the country. Uh, the majority of the states have, have raised their hand with, uh, with questions and concerns about this. Certainly the, uh, the, uh, the Massachusetts delegation has, has submitted letters in opposition to some of these changes. Um, in short, the, the regulations are sufficiently vague. It, it is not clear whether the, these regulations would be meant to apply to all licenses or only licenses on a moving forward basis. Uh, one, of the, one of the constraints that this regulation would apply wouldn't have an impact budgetarily on its face on, on the Dam, uh, Danvers Cable Access TV, and that is putting a 5% cap on the gross uh, annual revenue uh, that, a, uh, that can be provided in a license. Um, 
a change is that it would it would include capital items which have historically been treated outside of the three percent fee <clears throat> or five percent fee as being part of that fee now so if, if a community were already receiving a five percent fee um, and a separate capital uh, uh, apportionment that would now have to be included under the five percent cap so that would have an impact but at present uh, Danvers cable access receives a three percent fee and the totality of their capital would keep them below the cap so that would not have an impact but some of the other areas that could have an impact um, are some changes in language related to how the telecoms can value um, incidental or in-kind services so it, for example uh, Danvers cable access TV has three uh, paid channels and um, under these regulations the telecoms would be allowed to determine the fair market value of those stations so for example if it was another ESPN or something like that and they could sell advertising they could deduct that from the fee uh, and in some cases you could imagine it would com you, you could completely negate the fee uh, in its entirety so they they're they're pretty draconian in, in terms of the impact they could have on cable access TV however um, there are already a long line of legal challenges waiting to be um, submitted uh, it's also unclear uh, you know, some of what the FCC does um, is done under regulation some requires congressional action and with the turnover in Congress it's entirely unclear whether these there would be support in Congress to do this so all of that is to say the advice we have right now is to is to continue to move forward and negotiate this license in good faith in the way that we have in the past um, we may be looking at years of litigation there may be a new Congress by the time these get promulgated so uh, th those are a lot of words to tell you that there is really no good answer but um, <laughs> there's there's a lot of ambiguity right now about what what may or may not occur with these right and I think when I brought it up my point is I'm sure we're aware of it and we're monitoring it but we don't want to get caught blindsided but I realize we only get three percent and this number is five percent so it seems like we're okay but the, the real the real concern would be um, it, it the FCC has the the telecoms have not been asked to identify what those in-kind services would be what the incidental cost would be for example they could they could start uh, one of the examples given is a senior you know communities that provide senior discounts so under these regs it's conceivable that the telecom could start netting those out against the fee that it pays under the license agreement um, which again it's, it's hard to know the economic impact when it's not clear what that list looks like or what those may or may not be or how they're valued until until the bill is presented to the to license That's issuer a quick update on um, we had a, uh, the I guess jumping back to the theme of town meeting and budget we had a uh, forum at uh, Holton Richmond Middle School last Thursday related to the Smith School project and with 70 attendees uh, good good discussion uh, that we had a 30 minute session before the uh, presentation started uh, where all the members of the design team and the project team were there um, to answer questions and have conversations so and a lot of good conversation took place in a one-on-one -on -one with with parents and neighbors with some of the design team members um, and it was a uh, well attended so uh, moving forward on that uh, the next selectmen's meeting on January 8th uh, is uh, when we will be reviewing the warrant for the February 4th town meeting so that'll be the night that we discuss uh, the Smith school so we'll have the design team present to make um, a presentation to the board we can we can get into some detailed discussion about um, the budget uh, one of the questions that was a, a good question at the forum had to do with uh, how you go from the uh, the gross reimbursement rate on the project the 55 percent of eligible costs down to the the actual effective rate which is more like 39 percent um, and there are some caps that are uh, applied by MSBA that are baked into those formulas that end up um, putting a ceiling on the reimbursables that come far, far that are far less than uh, the gross reimbursement. So we can we'll discuss that um, on the eighth as well. Last item I want to just provide a brief update on. Um, well, two actually. I mean, give the clerk an opportunity in just a moment to discuss uh, some some news that broke uh, this week related to the the licenses that were pursued at town meeting last year, uh, the, the the ten additional licenses. Um, but just briefly, I, I wanted to report that uh, at the November 20th meeting, the board voted uh, to support uh, with minor modifications um, and clarification the recommendation from the chief and town council related to. Uh, the uh, the dangerous dog situation um, as of today uh, we have received neither any follow-up related to the items that were requested by the board 
uh, specifically a, a site plan documenting what the restraints on the property would look like, uh, the fencing as well as uh, a written training plan prepared by the trainer, um, nor have we received any notification of appeal. Uh, so the, uh, generally we would be notified if an appeal were filed. Joe's office has not received any notification of an appeal. Uh, uh, Attorney DeLuca's office has not received any notification of an appeal. Um, and based on the fact that no one is here tonight to address the, the, the request from the board at the last meeting, uh, I've, I've instructed uh, Attorney DeLuca to reach out tomorrow morning uh, to opposing counsel to, to, to seek an update. And I imagine at our next meeting we'll have some uh, additional information for you in terms of what the next steps may look like if no appeal is filed and they're uh, not obeying the, the uh, items within the disposition. If no appeal has been filed, because we've heard from opposing a, a counsel that an appeal was filed, but if we have not been notified of one, uh, by can we, can we <coughs> ask that the applicants be here to speak to the two conditions? We're looking to add measurement and looking for their we're looking for two things. One is for a description of, the, of their property and, and, the, and, and the restraint, and the other was to understand from a professional what an, uh, an appropriate training schedule or, or, or would be, um, because we don't know whether it should be weekly, monthly, quarterly. We're looking for a professional's uh, assessment. So if there is no appeal other than the statement by the opposing counsel, can we, can we ask that they be here at our next meeting? As I said, I'd like, uh, as a step one, I would like for Attorney, attorney DeLuca to make contact with their attorney. Um, it is possible, the, the appeal period would have ended just prior to this meeting. Mm -hmm. um, it is possible that an appeal was timely filed and we haven't received the notification. I, I think that that's unlikely. Um, but I, what I would suggest is that after Attorney DeLuca reaches out tomorrow, I'll be able to provide the board with a written update via email uh, informing you of the status in terms of what the next steps would look like based on um, the fact that clearly there was a, the, the first milestone um, re requested and demanded by the board was today. And, mm -hmm. and there is, if there no appeal has been filed, then there is failure to comply. Okay. So the, the subsequent question for Attorney DeLuca is, you know, what, what does, what if any is the next step that this board needs to take? Thank you. That's all I have. Uh, you wanted the town clerk to speak That's to right. You. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, uh, we received a notification today from the uh, State House that Chapter 285 of the Acts of 2018 relative to an act authorizing the Town of Damas to grant 10 additional liquor licenses for the sale of all alcoholic beverages to be drunk on premises has been approved. It was uh, signed on November 2nd, 2018, <coughs> and um, it's in effect at this point. So these are 10 that are designated to one of two zones? Uh, that's correct. Uh, to give you a brief update on what the bill represented, uh, it represented um, an opportunity for the town, the board, to approve 10 additional liquor licenses. They could be beer and wine or all alcoholic, uh, common victual licenses. And the town was divided in two sections, uh, section one for the purposes of this discussion is the Route 1, Route 114 Oops. corridor. The second um, area would be the downtown area uh, through the port and over to the Liberty Tree Mall. Uh, what these two areas uh, allow us to do that if there were a license to be granted to one of those areas and the place that it was granted to either needed to find larger location or did not cease, or ceased operations, that license could be moved within the district it was granted in. So it gives us a little more flexibility than the initial legislation that we had a few years ago where it gave us six licenses where once that license, one of those six was granted, it had to stay at that location in um, forever. And uh, as you know, right now, we, we do have one of those licenses that was granted to Tuscan Hills down on Water Street. Mm -hmm. That building sits empty. The business is no longer there, but that license sits there. Uh, we've had some recent conversations that it appears that there might be some activity down there, but uh, at this point in time, I have no official application that's been filed. Thank you. That's good news. Good news. Economic opportunity. 
Is there any other any discussion on those points or any other points the town manager made before he goes into his final uh, update? I All right. He did his update. No, he has one so, more item. So I just want to go back to what happened at the um, forum, and two things that I'm hoping you'll bring forward on June 8th was one, um, I agreed with Mr. Zuberick, and I wanted to say that publicly, that I agreed with him that the budget on the website is very difficult to get to, and I know that you and Rodney are working on that. It's it's we actually uh, we tried to put it up Friday and ran into we kept we've been on the phone several times with our web host because it wasn't showing up. It still isn't there as a standalone document, but if you go to the Ivan Smith webpage now, there is a bold sentence in the middle of the front page that has a link to the budget, and we're working with the web host to get that as a standalone document okay, on the webpage. I, I had to agree with them on that. Yep. And the other thing is um, it was requested that we do um, add to that the breakout on the reimbursable and unreimbursable, and, and uh, that and we'll would be that. great to see yep. that too. Yep. Those I, I wanted to give Mark a plug on that because I agreed with them. So. Mr. Town Manager, you had another point of uh, information. Probably the most important, and I'm going to blame the uh, the head cold that I picked up for my two-year-old earlier this week. I haven't I haven't been sleeping very well because Jack hasn't been sleeping very well. But <laughs> I provided a memorandum uh, to the board with tonight's packet, uh, dated December 14th, and it includes some follow-up items from the financial summit, uh, a couple of specific questions that were asked, and some additional material for the board's review. Um, First two, and I, I won't read the memo, but two two questions that were asked related to some of the larger uh, budget drivers that we have. One was um, if the town were to make a change from uh, the current copay health plan uh, to a high deductible health plan, um, which is an idea that actually uh, uh, came up w uh, in, in our meetings with the seven unions at last year's uh, IAC, actually two years ago when we were making plan changes to try to uh, buy down uh, what, was a, what was a significant renewal um, two years ago. Uh, the union said, we should, is it time that we look at a high deductible plan? So we've been working with our health consultant. Um, we've had a couple of meetings with, uh, with the unions, and, and after the holidays, we'll be scheduling some meetings with, with the non-union employees as well, just to start to talk through what that might look like, because that would be a, a pretty radical change for the employees. Um, but the, the short answer is there would be a uh, sort of a reset. Uh, the, the, the upside of making a, a plan change like this would be cost avoidance, not necessarily budget savings, but there would be a one-year uh, reset where we could expect, as I note in the memo, um, and, and there are a lot of assumptions built into this, but we, I asked the health consultant to kind of model out what that might look like, and there could be somewhere around a $600,000 year-over-year budget savings in fiscal year 21, which would be not this coming July 1st, but the following July 1st, if we were to make that transition. After that, you wouldn't see additional budget savings year-over-year, year, but you would be resetting that trend line, which is really the key for us with the health health care because we're, we're facing you know north of five percent renewals right now um, which puts a lot of pressure on the operating budget and then the second question was um, you know whether the whether the Danvers retirement board could vote to um, to revisit some of the uh, decisions that were made in the last couple of years uh, to um, improve the long-term position of the system uh, but certainly had short-term impacts on the operating budget and the short answer is, I think there, um, we reviewed this with our financial advisors. There would be a couple of um, red flags associated with doing something like that. First, you'd be shifting, you'd be creating additional long-term liability, and, and ultimately you'd be paying more uh, by, by re revisiting the two decisions, one of which was to reduce our assumed rate of return, um, the, uh, which, which increases your uh, short-term required contributions but brings down your long-term liability. The second. Um, was to uh, shorten by one year the full payment date of the retirement plan. Uh, so the, certainly, you know, we've made, we, we've benefited from some good returns in our retirement system the last couple of years, which has allowed the retirement board, um, which, which Joe Collins is a member of, to, to make some of these decisions to, to strengthen the financial condition of the system. Uh, to undo those would potentially have some short-term relief on the operating budget. Um, but but would be viewed negatively by the rating agencies and would increase our long-term liability. Um, the third question, uh, which is uh, uh, identified on page two of the memorandum, was you know, we, we modeled at the financial summit sort of the two ends of the spectrum in terms of what options we have uh, for financing the Smith School. Uh, and uh, we what you'll see in your packet is uh, a third 
model uh, that we wanted to show, which would sort of split the difference between the two. And, and just to qualify, you know, we are uh, Hilltop Securities that uh, they work work on behalf of the town as our as our financial advisors and work very closely with Joe. Uh, they they could generate you know as many different models as we would like to look at, but we wanted to show kind of the the spectrum. And so if if you're looking on page two at the at the table. Uh, if we were to do a 30-year level debt issuance, which is the same thing that we did for the high school project, uh, you'd have level debt for each year of the, of the project, um, and the total cost under that model would be a little more than $60 million, $32 million in principal, and a little more than $28 million in interest. Um, the uh, average tax bill would, would be up $157 uh, per year for the 30 years of the, of the issuance. Uh, the other end of the spectrum that we looked at at the financial summit would be a 20-year equal principal payment, which is uh, a modeling in which you would see higher debt service payments in the first few years and then a, and then a, and then a rapid decline in the, in the out years. Uh, the total project cost under that model was $46.2 million, .46 million um, with $14 million in interest uh, as compared to the $28 million in interest under the, under the, um, the longer model. Uh, you know, the uh, cost difference of roughly $14.3 million between the two models. Um, this one, however, would uh, result in, in higher average tax payments, but for a shorter period of time. So the difference in uh, uh, tax bills comparing the 30-year level debt to the 20-year equal principal is about $22 a year, uh, which, which means, in, you know, in other words, uh, you, would pay an, you would pay an additional $22 in taxes per year for 20 years uh, to avoid $14.3 million in interest payments over the life of the bond. And the third model, um, which would be a 25-year level debt, as you can see, uh, the total cost here would be a little less than $54 million, so sort of right in the middle of the two. Um, you'd pay $7 million less in interest. Um, it'd be a, a delta of about $12 per year in taxes. Um, and it would, it would be six, a little less than $7 million cheaper than the, than the least aggressive model, um, but also about you know, a little less than $8 million less in savings than the most aggressive model. Uh, I've attached to the memorandum itself a couple of tables. Um, they're very busy tables. Finance directors like to put tables together, um, but, but I'll, I'll briefly describe these two tables. Uh, one, of the, one of the metrics we look at when we're looking at our, our debt service is that we, the, the rule of thumb that a previous board had looked to, to adopt was a 6% of uh, operating revenues as a target. Uh, when we were developing our financial policies a couple of years ago, this is uh, an item that was of particular interest to Selectman Bennett. I think you remember those discussions, and that is that, that remains a, a, a yardstick that we look at. So on the peak debt analysis table that you have, we're taking the, the current budget uh, in FY19, and we're applying some assumptions based on uh, our, our recent trend. To, to show what uh, the, op the net operating budget might look like out the next five or six years. We're, we're able to then take 6% of that as a, as a target. And as you can see in the green, orange, and blue bars, uh, the first set of bars shows what the total debt service would be. So this would be the Smith School plus all of our existing debt over the life of that. And we can take that and back into the second set, which would show what would be needed out of the school stabilization fund in order to keep the net debt at or below 6%. So as you can see, the green bar for the 30-year level debt, which is what we did for the high school, we would be looking at needing around $8.3 million over the, uh, the peak debt years, which would be out through FY26, to stay at 6%. We're currently at $5.8 million in that account. So uh, between now and FY26, we would be looking to draw down that 5.8 and still be able to replenish it with an additional 2.5 million dollars out of free cash which of course is generated either by excess revenue or uh, budget savings uh, in years where we have mild winters we usually have a turn back um, but we've had two winters in the last four where we have needed to um, cover more than a million dollars in overage uh, for for winters um, on the revenue side we we routinely uh, spend somewhere between $600,000 and $800,000. Last year was a, a high watermark because of a good free cash number, but we generally spend between $600 and a million a year on capital expenses and cash. 
and that trends pretty closely with our uh, typical revenue turn back. Um, so we, we budget conservatively, but we also have, as I've described before, working reserves in Danvers, where we, we don't just put the money aside and, and let it sit. It, it, it's money that we use to, to support operations. So as you work your way down those bars, the, the orange bar in the middle would be the 25-year debt. So we would, we would require you know, $9.2 million over the life of the, uh, the peak debt years uh, to maintain 6%. The blue bar, the most aggressive bar, we would need $13 million uh, in order to stay below that 6%. Um, absent, a, some, you know, absent a debt exclusion, uh, essentially. There would not be a way to, to, to fund this project uh, and achieve the $14 million in savings without a debt exclusion. Um, so, and then I guess on the second, I would just point out, um, this is just a, the second chart, which at the top says debt model comparisons, takes all other debt off the table and just shows the three models that are presented in this material uh, for the Smith School itself. So the blue shows the 20-year, uh, equal principal, and you'll see the peak and then the decline. The red is the 25-year uh, level debt, and then the green would be the 30-year level debt. And off to the side, you can see the annual debt payments, which are projected out, um, and what the total for each of those models would be. Uh, the 30-year debt would be fully paid off in FY52, uh, and the 20-year debt would be paid off fully uh, 10 years sooner in FY42. And so I... Uh, Going back to the, the page two, I think at the bottom, you know, uh, I think circling back to the financial summit and some of the concept that, concepts that we've been talking about the last few years, uh, we, we, we've, we've attempted, uh, you know, former finance director Travis Ahern, while he was here, and now Rodney uh, Conley is on staff, and we're, we've been working for four years to try to position the town so that the Smith School could be done without a debt exclusion, and I think that there's a path to do that. Um, it would require uh, certain assumptions to break our way. Uh, you know, we would, uh, a couple of tough winters could put that uh, in jeopardy. Um, if revenue does not continue to um, uh, end up where it has, you know, within our assumptions, that, that could be, uh, we would have to revisit those assumptions, obviously. Um, but the, you know, the, the purpose, I think, we wanted to talk about things like service solvency and, and, and looking at kind of the impact long term. Uh, that's our job, is to, is to present that. Um, and so what you see here is sort of the three different models for how we can approach this project. Uh, and I'd be happy to answer questions about these materials or any other questions you might have uh, related to this or the, or the project or financing options. Thank you. Uh, thank you for getting the answers to those questions, Steve, and showing the third alternate plan, alternative plan. So uh, there's no question that we're going to have to assume the debt to pay for the Smith School. We have no choice, we need the school. Uh, elementary schools can't handle the capacity of the population increase that we're told we're gonna have. So we need the school. We're also constrained by the wetlands in that area to what we can build. So there's no question we have to build what the MSCBA tells us. We have to stay within their guidelines and we need to build a school to handle the influx of students over the next whatever number of years. So it's, it's a given, we've got to assume this debt. Um, I, I think you said there's no right way or wrong way in how to do it. It's obvious that the savings of $14 million is meaningful uh, going forwards. But I still think, I'd like to ask a few more questions. Um, the financial summit, you gave us some great information um, relative to aging population. Um, we really didn't dig into the weeds about how many of those senior citizens are homeowners, how many of them take advantage of Chapter 59 now, and is there a possibility for us to revisit Chapter 59 relative to clauses 41, et cetera, et cetera, um, to and see. Just, you're talking about tax breaks for qualifying seniors. Right, exactly. Yep. Right. Yep. So we're, we're, we're going to put this tax bill on the seniors, but is there a way for us to, through <coughs> Chapter 59, make some adjustments? Did we adopt Clause 17 where it lowers it from 70 to 65? I can't remember. I are we still at, head, are we still at 70? So, I mean, that's, Clause 17 allows for that, so it's another thing we can look at. Yes. Now, granted, when you do that, you need a f funding mechanism 
to offset that. It's less taxes coming in. So uh, I, just to be, you know, the the net effect of that would be to redistribute the, the redistribute. It would be shifted to not. It would be shifted to other residential taxpayers. Okay. We don't qualify for the So exemption. thinking outside the box, could we dedicate the fees we're going to get from the medical marijuana um, area and dedicate that somehow to that reduction in taxes or indirect so the because um, I don't think you've established an uh, a area for dedicating those funds that's correct the uh, the medical marijuana establishment is slated to open in January um, we received the, the first of two uh, pre-opening payments from the uh, establishment. Once the establishment is up and running, um, we, would, we would eventually, uh, I, I think internally the, the recommendation would be that we start to budget that as a local receipt in the revenue area of the budget. Um, absent that, it would flow to free cash and then could be used to buy down debt service or it could be used for capital or anything else. Um, so the, the, effect of, the effect of impact, if, if the tax abatement for the seniors were increased, that would have no impact on the overall tax levy. It would just shift the impact shift within it. the tax levy. But by, but by budgeting the medical marijuana revenue as a local receipt, that would reduce the amount <coughs> of levy we would need to um, collect by that same amount. So it wouldn't directly end up in the same. Right. It was 100000 the first year and 150 the second year. So, I mean, given the size of our budget, that's not much, but it's so it all helps. Would, it sure. all helps. Yeah. But to build on Dan's question, which I think I'm hearing uh, accurately, is if we were to uh, work hard to mitigate the impact on the seniors for this project, what would be the impact on the average homeowner not under this? Uh, you know, so does it go from $22 extra a year to $24 extra a year or whatever it might be? Um, or does it actually, because it's modifying the amount in all three models, really, uh, it raises all, uh, you know, it would raise all three of those boats equally with the tide uh, between the models. Right. I mean, does so it go from 179 yeah. to 183 and then blah, blah, blah? The so short answer is no. no. I mean, the, 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 um, the redistribution within the residential tax class wouldn't have any impact on the, the, the single, the, the median right. single family wouldn't change. It would still be the average that's presented what you'd see is because each in reality each taxpayer is different from the next sure but yeah. there would be there'd be a shifting within the residential class away from qualifying seniors to the balance of the class so everybody the person in a four million dollar home is going to pick up a larger piece of the abatement than someone in a home that is at, at the at the average Correct. For so and i don't know how many seniors take advantage of that chapter 59 i'm sure you don't know either but not off the top of my head but right exactly that, yeah. and looking at and staying within the guidelines the state gives us, can we look at that and perhaps make some adjustments to that at a future town meeting mm -hmm. um, for seniors, blind, and veterans as well? Mm -hmm. All three categories, which are covered under that. So just something to think about, and maybe we can... I think we had this discussion at another budget thing. It's not so much how many take advantage, it's how many qualify. Right, to qualify, exactly. And well, you can't take advantage if you don't qualify. Unfortunately, well, unfortunately for the seniors in Danvers, I guess, they do, they've worked really hard. Right. We have a very strong working class, and that was one of the things we recognized at a prior budget is many don't qualify because they've done so well and they've but if we change the threshold income wise age wise there may be so others that, that can by state regulation isn't that a state regulation? it's a state, can, yeah, yeah. state yeah. generally the, it's it's the the age and the benefit you can you can increase the benefit you can decrease the age i believe that the income qualification is spelled out but that's something tomorrow morning we, i can meet with the assessor and we can report back that's that's an easy question right. and i don't think we've right. looked at it at a town meeting vote for a number of years it's been a while since we've looked at it. Maybe we can just revisit it. We, we maybe do. There was a change in the law shortly after I started for the town. It used to be that the town meeting had to vote on this every year. <clears throat> okay. And then the law changed, and it was every three years. So we're probably due anyway. So that's why we, we, we I haven't seen it. We may be looking at it this May anyway. Okay. Um, so, but we'll certainly get started with some analysis on that. Thank you. Okay. Uh, other questions for the town manager's report? Uh, on the, on the, on the financial summit? Well, yeah. I, I just... Yep. Um, I came away with a takeaway from the forum, which is, I thought, interesting. One of the financial girls in town, not Diane, but another one, told oh, me that don't worry about the long-term costs because you're going to be paying 
in deflated dollars 20 and 30 mm -hmm. years from now so that the impact isn't going to be as much on our children and grandchildren as we might want to make it out to be. And I still think there's going to be a tremendous um, reluctance on the part of especially the older taxpayers in town to pay a disproportionately large share in the last few years that they're going to be here. Um, and as, as I said, had said a couple times before, I've been paying for a high school for 50 years in this town, and it's going to happen for the rest of my life, I know. So um, we'd just rather try to, and this may be a way that would de facto lessen the long-term impact for some of the older people, and I'm, I'm still concerned about the ability of the town to borrow money in the future for other projects other than schools, and I do like that 25-year uh, compromise. I think it's, it's going to leave us some more uh, freedom that we wouldn't have with the 20-year and certainly wouldn't cost quite as much as a 30-year payment back. So those are just the takeaway that I had was the deflated dollars going down the, uh, the road 20 and 30 years from now. Mm -hmm. Well, I got an answer to that deflated dollar thing. Um, so just watch your charts, um, look at uh, fiscal year 35, uh, pay attention to what that does. This doesn't go the 20 years in fiscal year 35. It changes. Um, for us, and already it improves us. So it's, we don't even have to go the full 20 years to get the benefit of the 20 years. So I love the deflated, but it's not out of my lifetime, even at 15 years, I don't think. So um, just just want people to, what I'm hoping is, is that as people make the decision, I, I'm not going to tell people what to do. But please, this time, educate yourself. Please. That's going to be the most important thing. That's yeah. all I say is please make the decision that you want to leave it to somebody else or don't. That's what I'm going to say. So. Mr. Mills, comments, thoughts? Nothing. Thank you. So we did ask the, you know, this is a, uh, to be frank, the elephant in the room is how are we going to pay for um, necessary buildings, necessary improvements, necessary services in a world where the expenses outpace and I'm not just talking about what we decide to spend on, but even those things that are health care, <coughs> oil, gas, wood, steel, a fire truck, a police, all those things are going. A salaries is, a, is the majority of our, um, of our budget. How do we live in a world where we're constrained on growth by Proposition 2.5, a, a 40-year-old law, when all the expenses increase by far more than 2.5 uh, regularly? And... I was waiting for this table, and I'm actually going to make my own talking point slide out of this. I'm going to take a couple of lines out because I think it's important for us, the you know the, the the number crunchers. But the thing I'm going to to to, to socialize with people <coughs> I know about is really what's the total project cost, what's the cost avoidance, what's the average tax bill, and what's the business in, the budget impact, because. I know there are people already gearing up. There's no doubt about it. There's no, there's no secret about it. We don't have to dance around it. There are already people gearing up to say no override. Well, first of all, those people are misusing the terminology. And I think one of the education points that is sorely missed is we're talking about a potential. We're not su suggesting it. We're talking about a potential of a debt exclusion, which excludes from the levy limit one single project for the life of that project. An override changes the levy limit forever. And we're not advocating that and never have. Um, but if we go down that road, I know we're talking about deflated dollars by going 30 years, but you also have to weigh that against the fact that it also reduces our ability to provide services. As the costs go up and there's less and less opportunity to uh, provide services, we may not be able to embrace things we want to embrace. We may have to start cutting back. And I don't want to throw out the specter of, of cuts or, at this point, That's, that would be, uh, you know, inappropriate. But the reality is that we're going to lose the opportunity. We, we will not be below the levy limit in, in near years, if that's the case. We have been. Um, we will not have the latitude to take on some projects that we may have wanted to, depending on the solution. Those who, who, who are firmly in, and I appreciate there are people who are firmly in the camp of, I'm going to say no exclusion. They're going to say no override, no two and a half override. I'm going to say no exclusion, no new taxes. I think the answer, the, I think the argument is, which is more painful to the taxpayer? $22 a year for 20 years 
or $14 million extra. To me, the prudent thing to protect the taxpayers is saving $14 million as opposed to 22 a year uh, for 20 years. Um, I'm going to take, we asked for this information, we asked for this other model, I'm going to take this and socialize it for the next weeks, and I'm going to suggest to the board that at our next meeting, we should take up the discussion about what direction we want, we as a board would want the finance to go in. I think there's still the open questions you've asked and can get those answers, but I would like to suggest that at our next board meeting, we, just, we as a board think about the direction we want to take as a financial model whether you yeah, want it to be one of the three. When do we have to vote to send it to an election? Mr. Town Manager, could you? There's, yeah, there's, I mean, there's some discretion there. I think, um, you know, we're on track uh, for the February uh, 4th special town meeting to consider the project itself. And the, the question of, it's, it's quite possible to approve the project um, and, and resolve this question after that. There's no requirement to handle it ahead of that. Mm -hmm. I think, um, you know, as I, as I heard the chair say, sort of, I, th I think the, for the board to do diligence and have conversations and think about what they think the right model is, we can revisit it. Um, we, it could be a standing agenda item until we reach a point where the board's comfortable um, with what it wants to recommend. But um, it's a question independent from the school project itself. Is yes, short answer. and Selectman Bennett made that, and I meant to echo his, the project is the project. That's happening. Um, that, that, that's almost independent. People will ask, what is the funding source? No doubt. That's a natural question to ask at the point we get to town meeting. Um, and so I think we, it would be prudent for us to think about, as a board, the direction we want to take. No, and Steve gave us a timeline. I'd like to kind of stick to that timeline. He gave, it, gave us, I don't have it in front of me, but. Okay. That's All something. Right. Yeah, from a from a budget perspective, I think the at the financial summit when the question was asked, we discussed you know sometime between uh, the February fourth special town meeting uh, and you know, we have the May town meeting. This would be a if if this is if the board wanted to address this question or ask this question, it's a question we'd want to have resolved prior to the town meeting. So, I think at the financial summit we we suggested perhaps late March would be an appropriate time, if the okay. question were going to be put before the voters to to look at. So uh, perhaps we can get through the budget budget hearing. Season. On that Saturday? Potentially, I think. Or but prior least, to or... But at least, as you're suggesting, or I'm hearing the suggestion, maybe not you particularly, February town meeting, special town meeting is independent of, of, uh, of, our, of our decision, of our thought on direction. Right, and I, I and you think might we owe to town meeting to yeah. give us their opinion yep. and hear what they have to say. Um, and then the meeting after that, we can... Perhaps be prepared okay. to move forwards. Okay. Okay. I, I, I'm, I'm amenable to that if the other board members are as well. Okay. And like I said, my talking point is going to be what's the best opportunity for the taxpayer? Twenty-two dollars a year or fourteen million dollars? So, um, is there any more discussion on this? I do have a question, and I was going to save it for new comments. But while we all have this document in front of us. I, I see a snappy new logo at the bottom of our uh, of this uh, of this uh, document. Is this a uh, a new town logo? Uh, a new um, what? It, I, I like it. Well, that's great. Um, the the I can't read the middle one. But our our core values, Danvers, and it has five uh, symbols. Mm -hmm. I think it's very nice. Could you? Elaborate. I would, are you not prepared to? Were you I will. Pre I will present the board uh, with the work product that resulted in uh, the new letterhead that you're looking at the next meeting. Don't don't Fantastic. steal my thunder. I will. Fantastic. I won't steal your thunder. Good. Thunder. Okay. Thank you. Hey, can you darken up the gray one? Yeah. <laughs> all right. <laughs> all right. Then that's all for your updates, Mr. Town Manager. Yes, it is. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Then we will go to the next agenda item. Right motion we accept the, the extensive calendar. consent calendar. Second. Motion made and seconded to accept the consent can calendar as presented. Are there any comments on the motion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Passed. At this point, we will go to new business, previous business, basically anything the selectmen want to put, throw out there. I'll start with Mr. Clark, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it was brought to my attention this evening, quite sadly, that we have lost one of our longest-term town employees. 
a dedicated member of the police department for many, many years. Uh, Officer Bertram Russell passed away yesterday. I know I'd heard that he was sick, and I was a big loss. He's still a big loss to this town. There was no person who was any more dedicated to the youth of this town and the caring of the people in this town than Bert. And he worked out of his way for many, many years to help troubled youth to go around the system sometimes and find employment for young boys who needed direction. And he offered his assistance innumerable times, and he's one of my heroes, not only for his police work, but for his battle record in Korea. He's a hero, and I'm going to miss Bert. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you sir. Any other comments or questions? No. Thank you. Mr. Mills? Oh, thank you, Gardner. I just wanted to mention once again uh, the Danvers Senior Center. And um, they have a <coughs> wonderful monthly newsletter. They'll <coughs> mail Excuse to me. anybody who wants it, but it's also online. Last night, I think it was last night, last night we had the annual, um, excuse me, the monthly men's dinner, which sounds a little like women should be invited. Well, they aren't right now. Um, it's a great little time. Um, and last night, Dan Bennett made a presentation uh, on the history, the formation, and the work product of Kiwanis internationally. It was really beautifully done. But I just wanted to mention that Larry Crowley, Pam Parkinson, and John Cohane are the core of making this wonderful little thing happen. And so for people my age in Danvers, be aware that there's all kinds of wonderful things going on. And um, you can check it online or just put a call into the Senior Center and get on the mailing list um, and uh, have fun. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, David. Did you pay for Dan? Because that was the agreement. <laughs> no, was I was a guest speaker, so I didn't have to pay. He still owes me the next time. Uh, <laughs> so you will still owe him. But it won't be your you first know, time. Every time no. he talks about this, my <laughs> uncle in goes to Florida, and there's this golf league, and they call it the OGG, the Old Guys Club. And every time he talks about this, I think about, so you <laughs> now officially are in the Old Guys game. <laughs> Dave, you I got to talk, talk, Dave. The <laughs> um, I have nothing except to say the forum, um, again, the presentations we're getting on the Smith School, you can't just go to one, you got to keep going. Every time I grab something new, so um, they do a good job. Thank you. And for pay doing attention that. to us over the next two months. You need to educate yourselves on this before you make any decisions. Thank you. Thank you, uh, I didn't receive any correspondence. The rest of the board had not received. Um, but I will, in thinking about the question that came up earlier, um, uh, I will ask the town manager to talk to the building inspector and find out if ZBA decisions stay with the property or with the business. Mm -hmm. And please, if you, when you get that answer, refer it back to, uh, uh, to so that we uh, might know that answer. I, I, yep. I, we aren't the we aren't the deciding border body. I wouldn't know that answer, and I don't think that the selectman would. Um, um, but I think uh, if you can reach out to Matt afterwards with the answer from the we'll building inspector. Call up the rich in the morning. Thank you. Um, I have nothing else other than on behalf of the board to uh, before I turn it over to Dan. Uh, wish the citizens of Danvers a safe and healthy holiday season. We just passed um, through Hanukkah, and uh, uh, and we're entering into you know the, the Christmas season. Uh, please enjoy your time off, relax, re um, recharge, and uh, enjoy a safe and uh, uh, sound holiday. That's all I have. Uh, Mr. Bennett. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So first, um, correspondence. I've been reached, I've been, you know, one of the citizens on Harbor Street has reached out to me a couple of times about 28 Harbor Street. And I understand that the zoning and building department are involved. There was a question regarding use of town property there <clears throat> that I had forwarded to Mr. Henry. Um, and he said that, uh, reminding me that um, the building inspector and zoning have been working on this since 2017, but there's still issues out there. And they're, they're looking for some closure. If I could pass this to the town manager, sure. as you can see, I'm sure he's aware of it, but I think the neighbors down there would like some closure to the issues that are going on at 28 Harbor Street if there are indeed violations. That does bring up a uh, point that I should have made under mine, and if you don't mind, because I'll dovetail to yep. that. 
Uh, previously, we have been uh, asked by a resident to look at some of those properties, and there is a, uh, and the and, and Mr. Clark brought it up uh, recently, but the town is meeting with the resident who had similar concerns about other town properties along the waterfront. I think it, his and, was the um, access of the water. Yeah. Yep. And so there is, uh, we met with that citizen, uh, the town administration met with that citizen is, and have formed a plan of action. It's ongoing, uh, just because uh, Mr. Cock brought it up a couple of weeks ago, a couple of meetings ago, I wanted people to know that there is a plan in place or there's action in place and that citizen is actively involved. Okay, great, thank you. There's another option, another property that was brought to my attention this past week, week is the end of Hardy Street. You may want to add to your Okay, so I don't know, and, and what prompted me to ask, mention that is I don't know if that's one of those properties and, and if Mr. Tom Edger can add Hardy Street to that discussion. And now, thank you for okay. indulging me. The other correspondence I got was an invite for a local climate leaders summit um, by the Massachusetts Sierra Club. <coughs> Merrimack College, January 12th, Saturday afternoon. They're inviting, it, the event is exclusively open to municipal elected and appointed officials. Um, they've invited all the communities. I believe that you, you got an invite. I got the invite. I'm unable we to attend. And, yeah, I think we all got it. But we all go I, I'm unable to attend. In, in so I'd be happy to attend on be behalf of the town of Danvers. Um, Massachusetts Sierra Club is on the forefront of a lot of great environmental um, <coughs> movements, plastic bags, clean water, et cetera, et cetera. But they're against the transmission lines of bringing cheap hydroelectricity from <coughs> Canada to Massachusetts. So I got to go find out what's going on. It's, it's interesting. So uh, I, I intend to uh, attend that and report back to the board afterwards. Thank you. You're welcome. And uh, as always, would like to thank the veterans for their service and as uh, Selectman Clark said, we lost a great serviceman uh, yesterday. Um, his wake is Thursday, 4 to 8 at Lyons Funeral Home. Um, Bert was a great guy. I only knew him for maybe 20 years, uh, but he was quite the, ma quite the man, and um, it's a loss. <coughs> but thank your veterans, current veterans, past veterans, future veterans. They're out there. Thank you. And Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, and New Year's. Happy New Year's. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Davis. I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. <coughs> second. Motion made and second to adjourn. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? It's a vote. Thank you very much. Happy Holidays, everyone.